Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my name is uh, Peter Moore. I'm working with a Food and Agricultural Organisation, and I have the great pleasure and honour to be your moderator this morning. Uh, and then uh, my colleague, Ki Kang Bay, will be moderator for the afternoon. We need to thank a lot of people for having this uh, together and organised, um, and we'll do that throughout the day. Please, a couple of um, housekeeping things. There is simultaneous translation, um, French, English, Spanish and Korean, and you will see the, uh, the, the earpieces and things next to you. If you use one, can you please leave it on the seat uh, when you finish? Uh, also, for those of us who are speaking, um, because of the translation, can we please be careful and measured uh, and, and reasonable about that? This event, the Special Fire Management Forum, Wildfires Beyond Forest, was requested by the Advisory Committee of the World Forestry Congress. Uh, it's, uh, it was reflecting what's been happening in the past, as many of you would have seen in the past few years. Uh, we see a lot of reporting on fires, a lot of uh, energy and, and enthusiasm and interest in them around the world, uh, and it is around the world. Uh, and so this morning, uh, as we open this session, we start to reflect on that through the day and you'll see some innovation, you'll see some new ideas and some reflection on the past and we have some very interesting panels looking at some major reports that came out and then we wrap up at the end with some ideas for the steps towards the future. So I hope you can stay with us and, and look through that for the day. This morning in our opening and scene session. We've, um, as these things happen, we have a number of people who are unable to be with us today. Uh, and so we've had some replacements. So Ms. Tina Vahanan, the Deputy Director of the Forestry Division, uh, is indisposed this morning. And so her place will be taken by Dr. Amy Deschel from FAO. Also, their excellencies from Bhutan and from Mongolia are also unable to join us today. But we're very fortunate in having His Excellency Minister White uh, the Minister for Water, Forest, Sea and Environment in Gabon with us to make some remarks and he has some very interesting things to say. And then the Director-General uh, of Forest, Environment and Conservation Department and Dr Fahouda Sali from Morocco who will talk to us before there will be a, a photo session just at the end for the speakers and the, and the dignitaries. So perhaps if I could ask Amy if you could come to the podium please and uh, and provide your opening remarks. Thank you, Peter, and welcome colleagues to the Fire Management Forum, Wildfires Beyond Forests. This is the very first time that a full day of the World Forestry Congress has been dedicated to this really important issue. So we're very pleased about that. And Peter and colleagues from, from the Asian Forest Cooperation Organization have put together a very exciting program today. So I think we'll all have a, a great learning for throughout the day. So it's a great pleasure for us to be here today with our partners in Korea, the Korea Forest Service, AFOCO, many global partners, including UNEP and the Joint Research Center of the EU, along with many regional and national collaborators. And our aim today is to really collectively increase the focus, understanding of, and interest in fire management. You know, already during the World Forestry Congress, we've seen the energy and power and creativity of being back together after more than two years, and really looking forward to continuing that dynamic discussion today. So please get ready with questions, comments. We want a lot of interaction throughout the day. We'll traverse the current fire management scene, um, starting with a reflection by, by a minister with deep awareness on the importance of the issue, followed by assessments of lessons learned and recent developments by, by many groups, the European Commission, Natural Resources Canada, the Federal Forestry Agency of Russia, the government of Timor-Leste, Korea, Brazil, Peru, and many researchers and trainers who will give us new directions in integrated fire management. At the end of the day, stay with us because we will announce two new initiatives that seek to scale integrated fire management and integrated risk management more broadly. Um, so we will announce those at, at, in the closing sessions. 
you know, in the current context of, of climate, the climate crisis and, and massive land use change, it's a core and key challenge to find the appropriate focus, effort, and balance in what's needed for fire management at local, regional, and 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 national le uh, global levels. Um, during the forum today, we're going to hear about what is useful, needed, and possible. And let's all play, pay very close attention since these inputs will form the basis for, for continuous efforts where we can work together to solve this, this major challenge. You know, FAO, we have a very clear mandate on our approach to integrated fire management. And it's the basis for our fire management strategy. It's really looking to first understand what's happening and why through a very careful review and analysis. And then it's looking to reduce the risk and prepare readiness. So a lot of upfront investment before any fires even begin. But then of course, helping countries respond to fire incidences and building back for, for recovery. Um, you know, we do this through participation in big regional groups such as the Expert Group on Forest Fires of the EU, the Fire Management Working Group of the North American Forestry Commission, but also through direct support to countries such as Sudan, Lebanon, Iran, Timor-Leste, Cambodia, Myanmar, and many others. Keeping forests healthy and saving lives, ecosystems, assets, and infrastructure by reducing risk and enhancing resilience to forest disturbances and large-scale disasters like extreme wildfires are key to achieving all of our collective goals. Thank you for attending. Really looking forward to the discussions that will happen today and the new innovative ideas that are coming out. FAO wants to assure you that we will continue to be here in the space um, looking for global improvements in integrated fire management and trying to reduce the, the related loss and damage that is coming from these extreme wildfires. Our best regards for the Forest Fire Management Forum today and the collaboration that will in, 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 ensue. And we will all be here to embrace these cross-sectoral efforts. Thank you so much and, and looking forward to the discussions. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, and then to, to have perhaps a, a national perspective from His Excellency Minister White uh, from Gabon. Please, Minister. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, all around the world, forests seem to be burning. Maybe we expect it in North America, in the Mediterranean. We don't expect it so much in the Amazon or, or in the forests of Indonesia um, or in the forests of West Africa. But, but, but you know, every time we turn the TV on, we seem to see forests burning. And it, it's, it's perhaps slightly ironic that I'm your keynote this morning because I come from Gabon. Gabon is the cloudiest country on earth. 88% um, um, covered in tropical rainforest. And we don't currently have a fire problem. And uh, I've been the minister for almost four years now, Minister of Forests, but before that I was head of national parks. And I spent a lot of my time trying to convince the foresters that they should be thinking about fire. As we do management plans for our, our sustainable forestry, we should be thinking about fire breaks um, being built into the, the, the timber cutting cycles. Um, and people tend to look at me as if I'm crazy. You know, like, like, this is a tropical rainforest, how could it possibly burn? So, so let me tell you a story. Um, that you may not have heard before. The oil palm, which has had such an influence on forests around the world, arrived in Gabon, as far as we can tell from the archaeological record, 2,800 years ago. It came from the Niger Delta. It was brought in by Neolithic people, so the first people who were farming and making pottery within which, I guess, they could store palm oil. So 2,800 years ago. 
2,600 years ago, the banana arrived from Asia, probably traded through Zanzibar and then across Africa. And at the same time, 2,600 years ago, iron arrived, iron axes. So we went from having polished stone axes, which weren't very efficient at cutting trees down, to having iron um, that diffused down from Niger um, further to the north of Gabon. And so all of a sudden, 2,600 years ago, we had iron to cut trees down, we had bananas, which require opening of the forest somewhat to, to grow, and we had oil palm, which also requires opening of, of the forest. And the human population expanded very, very quickly. People went from being hunter-gatherers to being farmers. And when you want to smelt iron from iron ore, you need hardwood charcoal. So they started producing charcoal, mostly from a tree called paduk, which is quite well known in the timber trade as a, a very red wood, very hard wood. So almost all of the, the charcoal and the iron furnaces that we find today was Paduk. And then about, about the same time, slightly later, 2000, between about 2,500 and 2,000 years uh, before present, so, so up to about 0 AD, um, we had a period, a s kind of snap climate change. We had a period that, as far as we can tell, was like 500 years of El Nino where we had hot, sunny, dry seasons. Uh, we have a very strange climate in Gabon and the western Congo Basin. Our dry season is the cool, cloudy time of year, today. Uh, so so in, a, in our dry season, it, it, uh, we have constant cloud cover because of cold ocean currents. That's why none of the current climate models at uh, UNFCCC, IPCC work for Gabon because we have this cold, cloudy, humid, dry season. Um, but for about 500 years, we had hot, sunny, dry seasons. And you can dig a hole, a soil pit, or a soil core, anywhere in Gabon. And when you get down to about two meters, you're going to find charcoal almost everywhere. In some cases, um, in central Gabon, we find layers of charcoal up to 20 centimeters thick, two meters down below the ground. And when you carbon date it, it dates back to 18, 1800, 2000, 2300 years ago. So a 500 period, 500 year period. And, and as you look across the Congo Basin, so these incredible forests of the Congo Basin, um, critical carbon stock, uh, today securing eight years of global emissions, um, actually from coastal Gabon all the way to Kisangani in DRC, basically the entire Congo Basin forests were farmed and burnt about 2,000 years ago. And as we look at how sort of human-driven climate change is going to impact influence the climate. Um, a lot of the predictions are that we may well replicate the conditions that we had 2,000, 2,500 years ago. So as, yeah, in, in my 35 years as a researcher in Gabon, it's one degree warmer. Um, the, the dry seasons do seem to be getting sunnier. If they get sunnier, they get hotter. If they get hotter, it actually interesting stops many of the rainforest trees flowering and therefore fruiting so it impacts the ecology of the forest but the potential really critical impact is going to be fire in these humid rainforests of the Congo Basin and so um, I guess my, my, my message this morning is that even in the forests that seem not to be suspect to fires, where we might be confident that it's not a problem, I think we have to be very, very careful. Um, and given the speed at which the climate is changing today, I think every single 
forest around the world should be putting in place plans to deal with rainforest fires. And if, like Gabon, you are a country that is putting um, a lot of emphasis on sustainable forest harvesting, um, there's a lot of lessons around the world that show you that when you log, obviously you put in roads, you, you, you fell trees, the sun gets into places where it didn't get before, it dries out the understory of the forest. And throughout West African rainforest, um, it's the, the selectively logged forests which are burning today. So, so, so beware. Um, if you're going to do forestry and tropical rainforests, put in place a plan. Um, think about how you might be able to, to limit the spread of fire. Um, because if you don't do that, I think over the next 50 years or so, you may regret it severely. And uh, it's a bit of a doom and gloom message, but I think, you know, like the Cub Scouts, be prepared. Better to be thinking about that today before it's a problem and putting in place management systems um, to try and minimize problems in the future than trying to react. Because at least in Gabon, we don't have, I can't remember how many it was, 87 helicopters that the minister uh, here in Korea had to mobilize when you had the forest fire a few months ago. Um, we don't have 87 helicopters to mobilize to deal with fire in Gabon. So uh, I think this, this workshop is, is timely, interesting, important, even for the, the most humid and the most cloudy parts of the rainforests of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, I think it's very interesting that 2,000 years ago, for 500 years, we had something that humans caused and created a charcoal layer, and now we're watching the climate perhaps start to do the same thing. Uh, and I think it's a very salient warning about that. And as Amy mentioned, pushing, and as you did, pushing the effort and the invest investment into planning and preparation and risk reduction is a much better idea than 87 helicopters is a very impressive number of helicopters, but it's also a very expensive and sophisticated requirement. So if we can avoid that, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much for those uh, very good opening remarks. I'd now like to call Mr. Dr. Sook, please, for his presentation. Lee Sook Wu. Dr. Wu is the Director General of Forest Environment and Conservation Department and the National Institute of Forest Science. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lee Sook Wu, working for Korea's National Institute of Forest Science. I'm very pleased and honored to give you a presentation on the topic of integrated forest fire management in Korea. Next slide, please. Next slide, yes. Um, <clears throat> recent years have seen record-breaking wildfire seasons across the world, from Australia to the Arctic. Uh, climate change and land use change are projected to make wildfires more frequent and more intense uh, with a global increase of, of extreme wildfires up to 14% by 2030, 30% by 2050, and 50% by the end of this century. Next slide, please. Uh, why does climate change matter? Climate change and wildlife are mutually exacerbating. Wildfires are made worse by climate change through increased drought, high air temperature, uh, low humidity, and strong winds. At the same time, climate change is made worse by wildfires, mostly by releasing more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Next slide, please. 63% uh, of land area is covered with forests in Korea. Unfortunately, in the past, almost all forests were devastated during, uh, due to overcutting, lack of regeneration, and the Korean War. Since the early 1970s, deforested areas have been restored. However, as the forests grew denser, the frequency 
and intensity of wildfires increased. Uh, nearly 72% of wildfires is caused by humans, such as campfires left unattended, uh, burning of ag agricultural waste and debris, and occasionally intentional acts of arson. Next slide, please. The Korea Forest Service is in full charge of wildfire management. Uh, every year, KFS establishes and announces the K integrated forest fire management plan to protect Korea from severe fires. This national plan includes strategies and action plans for fire prevention, fire suppression, community involvement, and law enforcement, etc. Next slide, please. Then, what can you do to reduce the frequency and intensity of wildfires? One of the answers is to manage forests in a healthier state. In other words, to create fire resilient forest. Well designed forest practice, including uh, thinning, pruning, and reducing vegetation, can create small openings in forest and reduce the buildup of fuels in trees and on the ground, which can lead to less frequent and less severe fires. You can see on the right, top of the right uh, corner. There are three elements that determine the behavior of wildfires. Of the three elements, we can control only fears. So this is one of the reasons why we are focusing on forest fuel management or forest fuel treatments. Next slide, please. Uh, both large-scale wildfires occur in the uh, mountainous areas of the East Coast. Aside from drier and more windy weather conditions, the fire vulnerability in this area is in part due to forest tree species. The dominant tree species in this area is a Korean red pine. As we are aware, pine needles and resin are both highly flammable, and extreme heat and drought make them likely to ignite. And once ignited, pine needles burn much longer and stronger than broad leaves. In order to protect this area from destructive fires, we are planting fire-resistant trees to create a fire-defensible or fire-break forest. We are also working to create more wildfire-defensible space around buildings located in or near forest. Next slide, please. For early detection of wildfires, KFS is operating 350 fire monitoring drones and 1,448 fire surveillance cameras. KFS has developed a smartphone application that allows anyone to report uh, the exact location of a fire and share photos and videos of the fire and track its spread. Wildfires are influenced by various factors such as weather, fuels, topography, geography, etc. One of the weather factors, humidity, humidity and wind speed, have the greatest influence on the occurrence of wildfires. So when the effect of humidity and wind speed reach a certain level, a forest, forest fire warning message is automatically sent to the local residents. Next slide, please. KFS has also developed a data-driven forest fire risk prediction system to facilitate a rapid response. Anyone can uh, access this system on the internet and get information about the expected risk level of the location of a concern in real time. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, forest fire fighting requires different techniques, equipment, and training from the more familiar structural uh, firefighting on the left corner. We have three uh, types of firefighters, including 10,110 preventive firefighters, 400 certified special firefighters, and 76 aerial firefighters. All these uh, aerial firefighters, also known as smoke jumpers, are the most highly trained, skilled, and experienced. They sometimes rappel down from helicopters to provide initial attacks on fi fires in remote areas. Next slide, please. 
Yes, for aerial firefighting, KFS operating 47, not 87, 47 specially designed helicopters from 12 forest aviation centers located across the country. In addition, local governments are operating 70 leased helicopters. Their helicopters use water and eco-friendly fire re uh, retardant to combat fires. KFS is also operating 18 specially designed drones to put out flames, during, especially during the nighttime. They spray uh, fire extinguishing uh, chemicals on the flame. Next slide, please. Yes, the forest fire monitoring system provides real-time information on the input of firefighting resources and the state of fire suppression. KFS has also developed the forest fire spread prediction system. The system provides decision support information to wildfire managers to determine where to deploy, I mean, position firefighting resources and how to evacuate the local residents. Next slide, please. Yes, although KFS is in charge of wildfire management, KFS, KFS cannot do it alone. KF, KFS works closely with other governmental partners, especially when a massive fire occurs. Recently, the interagency cooperation becomes more important because the wildfire management environment has profoundly changed. For example, longer wildfire seasons, bigger forest, uh, bigger fires, and more extreme fire behavior have become the norm. Next slide, please. Yes, there are two types of post-fire recovery programs. One is emergency stabilization, and the other is long-term rehabilitation. The first priority is emergency stabilization to prevent further uh, damage to life, property, and natural resources. In most cases, only a small portion of the burned area rece receives emergency stabilization measures. Severely burnt areas with accessible runoff or steep slopes of available facilities are the focal point. The stabilization measures should be taken as soon as possible before damaging rainfall or a storm occurs. Uh, rehabilitation is a long-term process that focuses on repairing natural resource damages. Measures include planting trees, re-establishing native species, restoring habitats, and treating invasive species. Next slide, please. Yes, we have some tasks to be done in the near future. Firstly, the safety and working conditions of firefighters must be improved. Secondly, we need to better understand wildfire behavior in the wildland urban interface because cities are expanding, expanding into forest and more buildings are being built close to forest. Thirdly, much more forest roads have to be built to give firefighters and fire engines an easy access to the uh, fire area. And since the majority of wildfires caused by humans in Korea, public education and awareness should be reinforced. Lastly, we need to further strengthen collaboration with central as well as local governmental agencies. On the other hand, since wildfires sometimes cross the borders, we need to further strengthen regional and international cooperation. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Wu, thank you very much. Um, as a fire management specialist, can I thank you for emphasizing humidity and wind speed? Um, temperature is important, but humidity and wind speed are so much more important in fire behavior. And uh, thank you also, because that's a, that's a very quick and thorough, but very comprehensive coverage of what is needed. The sort of thing that His Excellency Minister Lee mentioned, he does not want to have to put in place. In, in, uh, in Gabon, but, if, but by planning and having it organised, whatever he needs, you already have an example of it as you presented to us. So now we'll hear an example from another country, a very different country from Morocco, uh, Dr. Faoud Asali, 
who's the head of the Climate Centre, uh, will talk to us about monitoring uh, and management in Morocco. Dr. Hassan. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to deliver a speech at such a distinguished forum. It is a great honor and pleasure for me. I will be conducting my presentation in French. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers. Thank you very much, FAO and Korea Fire for your hard work in preparing for this event. Thank you very much, Korea Forest Service. I know that you have done um, great work to prepare for this event. I would like to talk about Morocco and I would also like to uh, talk about uh, a organization that I am a part of and the members of this organization are all going through climate change. We are going through very severe climate change and issues in our forests. That is why we want to minimize the negative impact of climate change um, to make improvements. It is because of our organization, we are going through many issues such as water resource depletion. As was mentioned by Peter, along with FAO uh, and other organizations, we wish to cooperate and to resolve many issues with Morocco. And it has been a long time since we have been working with uh, FAO. There are several projects that we are currently engaging in, and some have been almost completed, and some have been going on for five to six months. And if I do have the opportunity, I would like to share with you uh, what is currently going on. And, and I would like to share with you my uh, presentation file. And among the many projects that we are engaging in, I would like to talk about big data and artificial intelligence for predicting wildfire in Morocco. And we are cooperating with FAO for this project as well. Let us go to the next page. Morocco, from since 2009, has a web platform for predicting wildfire risk called SISFU, which rely on expert system and daily weather data. You can see there is a map and uh, the Ministry of Interior or all the Morocco wildfire management related personnel can log into this platform. We have had this system since 2009 and there is an expert system and there is a daily weather data system as well. And this allows us to monitor now, wildfire activities for in real time. In 2021, last year, we saw that it began to show limits and we realized that we needed uh, some refresh to the system, some changes. From 2009, we have been collecting great amounts of data related to wildfire events. So we have between 10,000 to 11,000 wildfire in our database, and we have more than 24 years of data in our database. So this is a huge amount of data and using AI and big data, how can we utilize this? Looking at the AI system, when we use artificial intelligence, we need to consider four factors. That is how we can utilize AI effectively to have good management. It is the same for forest fire management as well. In forest fire AI management, like in other cases, we need different toolboxes. For example, we need quality big data. 
And secondly, we need multidisciplinary experts. That is a very important factor as well. We have three to four experts that are working together and they are working very hard to apply this to AI models. Another important pillar is the third factor. This is high performance computing, HPC. This is also called a supercomputer. Looking at maps and images to collect this, we need to have high powered computing. This is a very important factor. That is why in the past, simple calculations took a lot of time, but now going beyond that through high performance computing, we are able to predict and calculate in a much shorter amount of time. And the fourth factor is AI algorithms. Now let us talk about AI prediction model and database. First, you can see we need to know about the fuel type, flammability, combustibility, uh, vegetation, bio volume. So we need to know about the fuel conditions. The second axis is topoclimate. So this can be topography, what kind of moisture history it has and what is the wind history, what is the temperature history, what is the rain history, and what is the bioclimate. Third is the population census. It is because regarding fires, it is very much linked to human activities. That is why we need to know about uh, the population census. Fourth are the neighboring facilities, roads, tracks, villages, cities, urban wild, wildland interfaces, and others. Fifth is remote sensing system. It is pictures taken from satellites such as Google Earth. Let's look at two steps towards our AI model for wildfire risk prediction. First step is historic data. We learn machine learning algorithms and we come up with predictive models. And when we run these predictive models, we can get access to more accurate data. Second step is new data predictor variables. We always need to think about variables, so that is why we need to come up with predictor variables and make a predictive model and to come up with predictive an analytics. Lastly, we need to get a ignition prediction map. I will not go into the details, but you can see a diagram of our AI system for wildfire prevention. For example, in our daily risk map, we have at least four predicting models that are used and used for deep learning. Graph neural networks, GNN is used. GNN is quite heavy on the system and second is bagging and boosting. This allows us to have more than 80% of accuracy for fires and 80% is quite a high percentage for wildfires. And you can see 80% accuracy for random and for XG boost, it is 87% accuracy. For logistic regression, you can see that it has 68% accuracy. However, compared to bagging boosting, you can see that the accuracy is a bit low, so we cannot say that this is a very good model for logistic regression. So comparing to bagging and boosting, we have to say that logistic regression is a bit uh, lower in accuracy. So we need to, I believe, focus more on bagging and boosting. 
Now, I would like to talk about which scope we should use for our AI prediction model. We need to capture visibility and secure visibility. We need to predict where wildfires will occur. So we need to get the visibility. And secondly, we need to have the best fit model by various risk base and scales. It is because the wildfires happening in the east are different from those on the west and south from the north. So we see the characteristics that are very different for different wildfires occurring in different areas. So we need the optimum model for different areas and risk basins. That is why we are studying this and cooperation, cooperating for better results. If we use the whole country as a scope, then it will be very hard to accurately predict. That is why for different areas, it is better to use different prediction models, and that will lead to more accuracy. As I mentioned, in the north, there's Mediterranean Sea, and the climate and situation is different for the area in the south. So we see different characteristics of wildfires. That is why we need to look at the different topographic factors, and we need to come up with a prediction model that will allow this. However, there are still many challenges that we need to overcome. We cannot use the traditional approach and we need to calculate huge amounts of data. So we see almost one terabyte of data to process regularly. And we also need diversity and we need variety, velocity, and veracity. So we need to have accuracy, volume, variety, velocity, and veracity. And in order for us to win the game and to overcome these challenges, graph neural networks are of utmost importance. AI model, if it is advanced, it needs more computing cap capabilities. So that is why we need supercomputing. Thankfully, after we initiated the project, we received great amounts of support. And as a result, in Morocco, we had the African Supercomputing set Center that was uh, set up in uh, 48 kilometers around, uh, apart from Barish. You can see we, we have the Supercomputing Center and you can see it's a 147th in the world. And we have a partnership with Cambridge University. So this is a fruit of that partnership with the University of Cambridge. Thanks to the supercomputing center, we are able to develop data uh, more rapidly and in a better way. So this is the result. Currently, we are upgrading our process and this is ongoing and we believe that in a few months time along with FAO, we will be able to give you our results. This system is very useful. It is because we collect all the data and analyze it and predict. Of course, we need to improve the accuracy a bit. Our team is constantly upgrading this and in order to prevent the black box syndrome, we are working very hard. And this is one of the challenges that we are facing. It is because when we utilize AI and big data, interpretability is very important. So that is why we need to avoid black box syndrome. And our team members are very enthusiastic and passionately studying this to improve. It is because uh, this will lead to better prediction and better wildfire prevention. You can look at the experts who are working with me, and you can see uh, Professor Haji, who is a big data and AI expert. 
And on the right, you can see Dr. Aloai, who is GIS and remote sensing expert. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you to our speakers for the session. I think we've seen uh, the, the key points in fire management. Uh, Amy mentioned reducing risk and preventing fires from causing more damage. His Excellency pointed out that the very long past of history can tell us that things have happened before and that we need to watch for what's happening in the future. A very complete uh, approach that Korea has, but notably an emphasis on restoration and still some things to do. And then Fahoud, who's uh, just in provided us with an indication perhaps of, of how, as His Excellency mentions, how do you monitor the trends where you look at the past data that you have and you keep watching what's happening. Um, we'd like to invite our honoured guests and our speakers to the podium for a photo session as we break for coffee. Uh, we'll come back from coffee at half past ten. Uh, and in the next session, we see a bit more technology about remote sensing uh, and, and space, but also three more examples of how things are being done in countries, uh, which I'm sure you'll find very interesting. So thank you to our speakers for the morning session, and if they could please come to the podium for us. Thank you, everyone. You can take your seats again, please, and we'll commence. So our next session is Innovations in Fire Management, in Forest Fire Management. And for that, we will be covering um, two presentations about remote sensing and developments in remote sensing and systems, and three presentations from countries. Um, I'll I'll flag uh, before the session that um, we're having some trouble getting connection with some of our virtual presenters, but we'll, we'll see about that as we go. Those of you who are interested in accessing the program, please be aware that on the website, on the World Forestry Congress website, um, the full program is available there. So if you're interested in what's coming up and, and, and what's happening during the day, um, please uh, check in there. And just a reminder that at the end of the day, as, as uh, Dr. Duchelle mentioned earlier, there will be some announcements about some international efforts in relation to fire management. So can I please ask Dr. Jesus San Miguel, who's the program officer at the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission, uh, to come and make his presentation, please. Jesus.
Hello, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Before I start, I would like to thank uh, Peter and FAO and the, the Korean Forest Service and the rest of the organizers for the invitation. And I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it must have been really risky to organize a presidential event like this one, but I'm really happy to see that it's a success and that there are so many people here. So as uh, Peter uh, introduced um, the topic, uh, my work is uh, based on, on remote sensing. We've been using remote sensing in the Joint Research Center of the European Commission for many years. And I will be presenting the expansion of the work that we've been doing in the European context to the global scale. So uh, the global system uh, follows something that has already been used in Europe. So in Europe, we started exactly 24 years ago. In the presentation of how uh, uh, he mentioned they are analyzing 24 years of data, we started in 1998, working with the countries to develop the system that would be able to provide harmonized information to the whole European territory. The problem in Europe, and is in any other region of the world, is that different countries have different systems. They even have different definitions of forest and different definitions of forest fires. So it is not possible to have a regional approach just by adding the information that is coming from the different countries. So that was the problem in Europe. The solution was to develop a top-down system, so based on some technology that was able to provide the same information to all the countries. And that was at that time remote sensing and geographic information systems. And we've seen in these last 24 years, we've seen we started working on remote sensing when remote sensing was really at its beginning. So we started with Russian sensors. Then we moved into Indian sensors. We moved into sensors of NASA. We have Sentinels. We have now many more sensors. Countries have their own sensors. So we are now, we have an explosion of data. And we've seen that uh, remote sensing is now proven to be better or necessarily complementary to ground data. The collection of ground data is very expensive and very large countries cannot collect the data from the ground. So the only solution they have a country like Brazil or uh, a large country, Russia, they need some kind of technology that allows them to collect the data as in near real time, but uh, in the same way for the whole territory, and that is remote sensing. Now, with all the sensors and the capacity we have to process all this data, remote sensing is really the solution. So the global system follows this approach in which we start uh, collecting information prior to the fire, providing fire danger assessment, then we have real fire events, monitor active fires in real time, map burnt areas, and on the basis of burnt areas, we analyze the damage, land cover damage, emissions damage, analysis of post-fire soil erosion, etc. until we monitor the regeneration of the vegetation. In the global approach, what we've done is build on what was already existing on the ground. And we are building on top of programs like GEO, the Group on Earth Observations, and the EU Copernicus program. There are already space programs that are supporting applic applications like the ones we are developing. The system, the Global Welfare Information System, is also supported by NASA. So NASA is funding projects to develop products from remote sensing that can complement what is already available in GWIS. And on the expert side, we build on what is called GovC Fire IT, the Global Observations of Forest Cover Fire Implementation Team, which is a group of uh, worldwide uh, uh, remote sensing experts that, that are developing products based on remote sensing for forest fires. The system is open, the same as the European system. The system is open and all the data are directly available on the web and can be downloadable. So that is the first principle of developing a global system. Because the idea is really to provide support for forest fire planning and management. Uh, we have uh, currently five applications. The first two applications, that one is called Current Situation Viewer, and the second one, a Current Statistics Portal, provide information in near real time. 
So provide information on fire danger forecast up to 10 days, uh, active fire information from different sensors, maps of burnt areas. And then we have a series of applications that are more for planning. So country profiles, we have analyzed all the data at country and sub-country level from 2001 until 2019. And we are now upgrading it to 2021. That allows to analyze fire regimes at any level, well, at any, anywhere in the, in the world, and then uh, analyze potential ch changes that may come with climate change. Then we have long-term fire uh, weather forecast and data and services. But I will show this in detail in the next slides. This is the first slide, this is fire danger. We are currently using the fire weather index, the Canadian system, as the default, but we are also computing other indices such as the Mark 5, the Australian index, or the National Fire Danger Rating System Index. We are also computing drought indices such as the, the uh, Kitsch uh, Byram. And we may add other systems and other models into the system as the, the system is further developed. The second application of the, the current viewer is the, the mapping of active fires and burnt areas. For active fires, we are currently using VIRS and MODIS sensors. Since VIRS is on top of two satellites, we have four passes every day. And then we have four passes also of MODIS. In total, we have eight passes in which we can detect an active fire if it is burning on the ground anywhere in the world. And this is continuously updated in the system. And then finally, in order to have a near real-time information of burnt areas, we are analyzing uh, the burnt areas on the basis of polygons that are generated from the hot spots that are detected as active fires. It is a first approximation, but in terms of a first approximation to burnt area at the global scale, it is uh, fairly um, reliable. And this allows us, for instance, to monitor the fires anywhere in the world. And in 2019-20, there were problems with the statistics in Brazil. There was the COP, I think it was the COP 25. There were discussions between France and Bolsonaro in Brazil and Germany on the statistics on, on the burning of the tropical forest in Brazil. Then we started providing weekly reports on number of fires, burnt areas, impact on uh, protected areas, forest damage, and we were doing that for the whole year in 2020 and again in 2021. Also information on emissions, land cover damage. Then after two years of doing weekly reports from August until the end of the year, we really realized that that was really unbearable. It was a lot of work. Uh, just in, in producing the reports. So we decided to automate the process. And we built an application that is called the GWIS Statistics Portal. The, this GWIS statistics portal provides the same information that was produced for the reports, but in near real time for any country in the world. And here is the graphs that are produced. So information, number of fires, burnt areas, uh, and on a weekly basis. The, the information is updated daily, but for now we are publishing and plotting the data, the data on a weekly basis. This allows to really have a, the monitoring in near real time of anywhere any country in the world in near real time. This type of uh, solution or approach was completely unfeasible like four years ago. So we never even thought that we were able to produce something like the data we were producing in Europe at the global scale. Now we are collaborating in South America a lot, but we are collaborating with other hubs, for instance, from a US Forest Service or USAID in Nepal or in other regions, also in Africa, Western Africa. The, just as an example, this is the, the areas that were burning in 2020. These were the first in Western, and this information was produced in real time. So the Western uh, USA that burned completely affecting the whole country. Situation in Brazil, that was some really unbearable in 2020. Australia, and this reflects what we were discussing before, the climate change, and this, these were unprecedented events. Same in, in Asia, although in Asia, I mean, uh, is known that the, the burning, the use of fire as a tool is what is really creating the problem of fires there. 
not so much the climate. But then again, the Arctic. The Arctic, the monitoring of the Arctic shows that the number of fires and burnt areas in the last four years is really unprecedented. And it's showing that we have to do something to change this type of regime for forest fires. As I said, a global system such as TWIS is the only tool we have to produce this type of statistics at, those, um, at that global level. And then uh, moving into the applications that are more towards planning, we've created what are called country profiles. This application has been really created in close collaboration with FAO, in fact, with Peter. So we have to thank Peter a lot because he was discussing with countries while the tool was being developed and asking the countries which type of uh, graphs could you use for planning? What are you interested in the number of fires, the size of the fires? What is the, mm, the periodicity of the graphs that you would need for the, the planning of fire management? And then what type of spatial products should be produced? And this is what is already in the system. So you have on the top uh, left hand uh, a general information on the country, a uh, land cover, a uh, number of hectares of different forest uh, cover, uh, land covers. Then at the bottom, you have the spatial information of the areas that are burned on a monthly basis for a given year, but then in the last 20 years. Then you have information also on the timeliness of this burning. When are these areas burning during the year? and also on the frequency, how many times this area has burned in the last 20 years. And as I said, this type of information was not available before this, this uh, tool was developed. It is based on MODIS, uh, MODIS Collection 6, uh, that is really a rough approach because it is 500 meters. So we know we are able to detect fairly large fires. But even with that, we know that around 2% of the fires cause around 80% of the total burnt area in most countries. So it's really large fires that create the damage. And this type of information is available in the system. So uh, at the bottom, uh, finally, you have information on uh, fire size depending on the month of the year, which is very interesting because you can really plan. We, you know that in July is when we have fires above 100 hectares. So we have to really plan for July or if it is in September, the same thing. And then finally on emissions. Emissions is a topic that is of high interest for most countries. So this type of information, as I said, is produced at country level and sub-country level. Information of the different types of pollutants, uh, the pollution by uh, land cover type, and we've used in this application the, the methodology that is used in FAO, in FASTAT, because it's the methodology that is being used by country to report and also to, to prepare their NDCs, the National Declaration. So, and the information will be updated, as I said, uh, on a monthly basis. Finally, a monthly uh, weather forecast. We use this in Europe a lot. Now we are talking with the civil protection uh, of the different countries in the European countries, and we use this is probabilistic modeling of anomalies of temperature and precipitation for the next six weeks and for the next six months. So when we see a tendency in the next three months of uh, above average temperatures and below average precipitation, we know we are gonna be in trouble in the summer. And that is the way we use this uh, type of anomalies. We, are, we sent a, a report to the civil protection in the European Commission last week. And this year we, are, we have a number of fires above the total number of fires of the previous year, 2021. And 2021 was about the, one of the worst years in the European Union. So we know that this year in the European Union, we are in a difficult situation. Looking at the forecast that was included in the report, we know we are going to be above average temperatures for the next four months and below precipitation. So this is the way we use this tool and we think it is very useful and now it's implemented at the global level. And then finally, access to data. So all the data are published in the system either in real time or as statistics are downloadable from the system. Finally, I would like to mention that what we've developed in Europe with, in collaboration with the countries, and here, I mean, um, we have at least two 
of our representatives from the national administration. We have Fouad Asali from Morocco, and then we have George Mitri from Lebanon. They are part of what is called the expert group on forest fires, which is just a, a group that meets twice a year and shares good practices on planning, prevention, firefighting, restoration. And we are trying to replicate that somewhere else in, somewhere else in the world. And we are starting with South America. So we launched a project in 2020 that will last for three years, but this project that aims at really minimizing the impact of fires in the Latin American and Caribbean countries will continue under a program that is called Team Europe Initiative on the Amazon, and that will run from 2022 until 2028. So we are now Next week, we have a meeting with uh, the Fire Administration in Chile. We have already met with all the countries in South America. The plan is to develop a platform that would allow to build the renal system, such as the, the one that was built in Europe. And then, as a summary, what can uh, the global welfare information provide on a global scale? Clearly, analysis of fire regimes in different regions of the world then to make and produce data that are comparable across the globe. Because if, even if countries have very good systems, if the systems are not comparable, then we will never have information on forest fires globally. Then providing near real time and also on a planning phase, a reliable data. And as Fouad mentioned in his presentation, we are getting better and better in the production of remote sensing product, but also on the analysis of this product through artificial intelligence and through many other methods. Then, uh, provide systems that are available at the national scale. When we discuss with the countries, we many times realize that even within countries, there is lack of communication uh, among administrations, and the administrations are not sharing data. So the system is open and all the data are available uh, to everyone. This allows also to increase awareness on, on forest fires as it happens in Europe, because citizens are really monitoring what is going on as regards forest fires. And having an open system that provides information in real time really opens possibilities to citizens. And then it provides methods and tools for support and preparedness. And then finally, um, there was a, in Nature an article a couple of years ago calling for an, an international in initiative to uh, store and monitor fires globally. And we believe that GWIS can do that. Finally, uh, capacity and training of both uh, firefighters, professionals, but also citizens and any kind of a, yeah, organizations are working towards minimizing forest fires. That's what we aim at with the global wildfire information system. I think that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you very much, Jesus. Um, we've already seen AI. We've seen uh, excellency suggesting that we should have trends, and now we have a data set and data sources. For those of you who haven't looked at the country profiles, I'd really urge you to have a look. For, for many countries it might be uh, you already have something more, but for many countries it's a fantastic starting point of those that data for over 20 years. We now have our first virtual presenter, um, Dr Joshua Johnston from uh, Natural Resources Canada, uh, who's also going to be talking to us. Joshua, are you linked in? I believe so. Can you hear me, Peter? You are, definitely. Thank you very much. You can, um, if, you, if you understand what I mean, you can take the floor. Oh, thank you, sir. I could do that. Uh, good day, folks. Uh, very, very happy to be with you today, although not in person. Um, I will not be starting my video, unfortunately. Uh, uh, well, I lost connection just a moment ago, so I'm a little bit uh, touch and go on the, on the remote access here. Um, Today, I'm going, to, I'm going to be talking to you folks about uh, the CIOS Working Group for Disasters a wildfire pilot. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if my slides are going to come up or am I being asked to share them on my side here? Josh, they'll be shared from here. Okay. Sorry, they're just putting it up. Uh, it's all good. Well, in the meantime, I'll just say hi. Uh, and uh, 
Okay, I think that we are we're about to kick off here. So, is it uh, at all possible for me to see the slides as well? To forgive me. Uh, yeah, I won't be able. I won't. I do not have access to a camera. Sorry, I keep seeing a thing pop up trying to turn on my camera. Okay, hi. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, it's a little bit of a rocky start, but that's the way the first remote one tends to go. So what I want to talk to you about today is this uh, wildfire pilot that sits underneath the CIOS Working Group for Disasters. Um, myself, although I am from Natural Resources Canada, uh, I also sit on that uh, Goffsey Gold Fire Implementation Team that Jesus mentioned, and I actually work uh, with Jesus on, on a number of these uh, sort of international remote sensing uh, groups. Uh, so it's actually quite nice that I'm following behind him here. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, what I am going to introduce you to is what CIOS is. Um, ah, here we are. So if you haven't heard of CIOS, you can be forgiven for that. Uh, it's really something that's more familiar to, uh, to remote sensors and in particular people who work with space agencies. So what it is is kind of a consortium of a large number of the world space agencies or, or member agencies for countries that do not have a dedicated space agency. Um, and it, it does an awful lot of interesting things connecting uh, different, different groups, different working groups uh, related to Earth observation and satellites, uh, as well as forming virtual constellations and facilitating sort of space missions that uh, involve multiple countries contributing to different components. But to this audience, the Working Group for Disasters is probably the most familiar or the most relevant portion. Um, and that's all hazards, in fact, uh, not, not just wildfires. Um, and underneath the Working Group for Disasters is where the, uh, the International Charter for Disasters sits. So if you've ever seen in the past when there's been a major natural disaster, uh, countries will enact this charter and gain access to all kinds of uh, public and or private uh, satellite data to help uh, instigate that disaster relief. And so uh, about, well, in 2020, this group reached out to us. We were doing some engagement around the, the Canadian wildfire SAP mission. And it just so happened that we were approached by CIOS and asked to propose a pilot uh, under the working group for disasters to look at wildfires. And that had never happened before. And it was a unique opportunity uh, but it also caused a kind of a moment where we had to think, well, what would be the strategic advantage to this? And, and what what could we add through CIOS that we weren't able to deliver through GOFC? Um, and uh, and so I'll, if we go to the next slide here, um, I don't think I need to beleaguer the point that uh, wildfires are getting worse under climate change, but really what we're trying to do at this point is figure out how can we how can we strategically find the right place for the for a wildfire pilot under CIOS? So if we go to the next slide, wildfire remote sensing can can effectively be separated into three disciplines. You you can observe before the fire to get an idea of the fuels that are there, the moisture, sort of the the inherent risk that is that is existing. There's the active fire observations. This is the stuff that uh, Jesus was talking about with MODIS and VIRS, where you're actually detecting the heat from fires and, and looking for them while they're actually happening. So, so more of the emergency management side of it. And then the post-fire remote sensing, where we're measuring the burned area, the severity, looking at the impact, the recovery, the losses. Um, and if we go to the next slide, what we opted to do in the pilot was focus in on one of these subdivisions. This is a pilot study, let's be very clear. So uh, active fire observations seem to be the most pertinent in terms of emergency management and fit the theme of the working group for disasters. If we go to the next slide, uh, and as Jesus just illustrated quite nicely, 
we are incredibly well evolved in terms of wildfire remote sensing, uh, particularly active fire remote sensing. We routinely measure uh, the energy release from wildfires. We detect them, we map them. We can even do near real time carbon emissions uh, and air quality monitoring from these observations. Um, in terms of the science of what's going on in an active fire remote sensing, we are we are in an extremely mature state. If we go to the next slide, uh, of course, not knowing I was going to be following Jesus, I actually was about to mention the the GWIS system, uh, but I think that that has been delivered in a far better way than I can. So we can move along to the next slide. You see, the problem is is that if we have routine fire monitoring, we have routine access to this kind of information, um, that's wonderful. But the real challenge is when things stop being routine, when things turn into that chaotic event, when everything is going wrong. Um, I myself is, you know, I spent the first half of my career as a, as a firefighter and as an instant commander. And I can tell you that when things are not routine, that is not the time to learn how to do something. And so if we go to the next slide, it basically the, the real challenge is about coordination. And, and we can't achieve that in a state of emergency. What we need to be doing is really trying to build on the users and build on the appetite for actually consuming this remote sensing data when things are in that routine state when it is day-to-day -day fire management, how do we use these things in our lives so that when things escalate, they're not new tools to us, they're familiar tools to us, they're things that we can actually ingest in a meaningful way, uh, not, while we're, not while we're under extreme pressure. But there's also some other interesting things that are going on, right? Um, if we think about uh, the systems that Jesus mentioned, things like MODIS, uh, I would challenge you to, to think about all of the active fire data that you might get from satellites and ask yourselves what those satellites were actually built for. Because the truth is, is that almost all of our Earth observation data for wildfires comes from satellites that weren't explicitly designed for that purpose. And oftentimes, they're not even operational systems. They were more science missions that we figured out a good way to derive wildfire products from. And so that raises some questions. If we go to the next slide, it raises a lot of questions about uncertainties and unknowns. Because if you are not the primary purpose of a satellite, um, it raises a lot of concerns in terms of well, who is the real driver behind this? Uh, what is the longevity of the systems that we're using? When, are, when is our coverage going to end? I mean, MODIS is a decade past its life, and, and word on the street is that this is the last year. You know, uh, and I, I'm not to confirm that. I'm not from NASA. But, the, um, you know, when we have emergencies, are we actually in a position to support them? Are we are we putting an operational requirement on a system that's not designed for that? Um, and beyond that, does my needs as a Canadian fire manager, uh, are they the same as those in Brazil or in Australia? How do they relate? What are our priorities? And here's an even bigger question for you. 10 years down the road under climate change, if my priorities are shifting and they're shifting in other places of the world, are we going to have the coverage that we need from the satellites? Are we going to have the ability to keep on performing routine fire monitoring or emergency fire monitoring for that, ex for that sort of problem space? Ultimately, what it comes down to is what is the plan? Uh, to some extent, we have been existing fortuitously on, on systems that just happen to exist, and we've figured out really good ways of using them. But we need to figure out a way of coordinating a strategy. If we go to the next slide, this is what we wanted to address in the wildfire pilot under CIOS. 
we, we have the ear of all of these space agencies. So the real plan was, well, why don't we take a real hard look at every possible aspect of Earth observation of active fire? You know, I'm talking about an absolutely comprehensive um, uh, comprehensive gap analysis, not just of what we have now, but what we'll have in the future and how that relates to to climate change and where the risk and the priorities are going to change in the future. We need to figure out who are all those stakeholders, who are the end users all over the world, how do their use cases vary? You know, are we meeting their needs? Are we are we exceeding their needs? Or are we not even on the mark at all? Who are they? Um, and then from that, we can define requirements for all the different systems, and we can present a strategic sort of plan uh, to CIOS for what needs to happen, when it needs to happen, to make sure that we're not just we're not just reacting to climate change, but we're staying ahead of it, and we're making sure that we are ready for what's coming next. If we go to the next slide, very quickly, because I know I'm I'm running a little bit slower. Forgive me, it's late here. Uh, as it stands, we're in phase one. Uh, we're about halfway through phase one, I would wager, uh, conducting in parallel that gap analysis with the stakeholder analysis. And uh, in the next year or two, we'll move on to the next stage of defining the requirements and whatnot. If we go to the next. So, um, Briefly, this is just kind of an overview of what we've accomplished to this point. We are a little bit over a year, about a year and a half into the actual uh, the actual work being done here. If we go to the next, we'll, we'll zero in uh, on the next slide here. There we go. On objective one, uh, there's actually kind of two studies that are going to be coming out of this, one of them being uh, looking at sort of a global forecasting of changing fire regimes based on changing fire danger uh, using the your standard sort of GCM approach to looking at whether the uh, Canadian Fire Weather Index will be the, the fire danger rating system being used. Uh, this will have its own standalone value, but it is being used in the context of our gap analysis. The next slide is a point of interest, and this is part of why we chose to do this under CIOS, CIOS has records and plans from all these space agencies about the missions that they have done and the ones that they're going to do. And what you see in front of you, and I know you can't read all those names of, of uh, the satellites, those are all the systems that have thermal capabilities and have the potential to be producing fire products. The ones in orange are the only ones that we know of that have a routinely produced official active fire product. So it raises some important questions about what's the deal with all the ones that don't have a fire product. And we are looking actively at this point to find out if some of these could actually be used to add to our complement of systems or if there's reasons that they can't be. But in order to do a gap analysis properly, you definitely need to take a very close look at these things and uh, make a decision about whether or not you do need to build a new system or if we can use better what we currently have. If we go to the next slide, wonderful. Uh, objective two, this is our, our stakeholder analysis, our end user analysis. Uh, Wonderfully, this is something that Peter, uh, our wonderful host this morning, has been uh, has been championing and leading for us. And so um, he's certainly better than I am to speak to this. But what I will say is that uh, a lot of groundwork has already been done uh, in this in this side of things. But we are kind of getting to a point now where we need to start doing some very targeted consultations. Um, working with some focus groups from different regions, as well as finding those sort of key informants to have a real in-depth discussion with. Um, I think one of the benefits that we could have out of this conversation would be um, if any of you out there are interested in participating and sharing your use cases for active fire remote sensing, what your priorities in your region or your country are, uh, please, Go find Peter and uh, and talk to him as quickly as you can. Uh, 
And if we go to the next slide, yeah, just, just at a very high level, objective one is one of those things that, it, you know, we have an excellent science team attached to this. Uh, they are pursuing this in a very methodical way, and I, I have no doubts that we will come to to a, a very fine set of of publications and products out of that in the next uh, in the next year. Objective two is one of these things that I have every confidence in Peter, but at the same time, it does depend on people like yourselves. If you have something to add, if you want to be a part of this, if you want to facilitate us in setting that direction for how we're going to coordinate satellite development over the next 30 years, please seek us out, either myself or, or Peter or both, everyone. Uh, we Your participation is really important to us here. And with that, I think the next slide is the end. Ah, and it is. Thanks. Um. Thank you very much for the presentation, Josh. Uh, it worked very well. I'm not sure I thank you so much for nominating me in front of all these people to be contacted. But, um, and, and I am really, I would be really interested to talk to any of you who get contact details, but perhaps after the day's session is finished, please, because I have a few things to do <laughs> until then. Uh, our next presentation is, uh, we go down to the national level. And firstly, we have Dr. Claudino Nabias from Timor-Leste, where they did a, a very, very good, one of the best reviews of uh, the current state of their fires and fire management ever. Dr. Claudino, are you uh, on the line? Hello. Oh, there he is. You're on mute, Claudina. Yeah. Oh, much better. Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the time. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be here to present uh, the result of uh, our study uh, on the um, fire incidents, uh, its determinants, and uh, customary management in Timor Leste thematic review. I don't know exactly whether uh, the slides can be uh, show it, uh, um, but anyway, uh, while waiting for the for the slides, um, the study. Um, uh, was done with the team. I myself, uh, Claudine National Vice, um, uh, with the team leader uh, uh, Rafi Fibrer, Mr. Tony Butler as uh, international consultant, uh, Mrs. Naila Yasmin, FAO GIS specialist, Dr. Peter, Peter Moore, consultant FAO fire management. Um, so the result of uh, of the, the study I would like to present uh, in this uh, World Forest uh, Conference. Uh, let me see if you can, okay, thank you. Thank you for the, for the slides. Next slides, please. I, I hope that this uh, presentation, uh, the participants, uh, particularly for the uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of the Timor-Leste and uh, the delegation also participate in this uh, session. I hope uh, so. But anyway, uh, I'm going to present uh, the contents of my uh, the study. Is the first is the study overall thematic review approach or um, the methodology that the, the team used to collect the data, uh, results, key drivers of fire, way forward, and uh, government is actions. Next slide please. So Timor-Leste has uh, two different uh, seasons uh, with the dry seasons and uh, a rainy season. The, the normal rainy season uh, starts from November and end in May or in July, depending on in which part, in the southern part or in the northern part. And also uh, the dry season starts from uh, June 
to October or sometimes in, in November. It's depending on in which part, in the southern part or in the other part. So if you can see in the two different pictures here in the same place, but the two different pictures in different conditions, the dry season and the rainy season. So during the dry season, the molest is prone to fire during the dry season. It's very easy to be uh, to get uh, fire. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, agriculture practices in Timor Leste still use uh, uh, slash and bark as a uh, uh, main activity of uh, of uh, pra agricultural uh, practices. Even uh, steepy uh, sloping area also can be used for uh, for farming. So uh, the land that been uh, used uh, for the farming. Uh, they can get a good yield in the first year or in the second year, at least in the second year. But then after uh, two years, uh, the land will be abandoned or, or left in the fallow. And then the land will be uh, regeneration of eucalyptus and invasion of the land by a chromolania, uh, new species of, uh, of uh, weeds in Timor Leste. Next slide, please. Sorry, I think this, uh, okay. Uh, this study has uh, four uh, uh, outputs. Uh, the first uh, is uh, using the remote sensing by, uh, to analyze uh, uh, the data. So we're using uh, high resolution imagery and accuracy assessment. The second output is the customary land management. So we uh, collect the, uh, um, uh, we do some of uh, review of the review, uh, the review, and also field observations. Or put a legal and policy framework that uh, um, um, used by the government or other uh, institutions uh, to uh, to use that uh, legal uh, legal and policy framework. The output for community fire management analysis of fire determinants through community focus group discussion. Next slide, please. Approach or methodology that you, we use uh, during the study, uh, we did a consultation with stakeholders, either VIPs, or relevant directorates, uh, directors, or some important person that we can collect uh, data from them, the information from them. Direct field observation along uh, Transex. Uh, Timor Leste has uh, 13 uh, municipalities. Nine out of uh, 13 uh, was uh, um, included in the in this study. Assessment on community fire management. Uh, focus group uh, discussion uh, with the community. Semi-structure uh, questionnaires. We develop uh, questionnaires, about uh, 60 uh, questions uh, in the questionnaire. Um, and then 13 uh, municipalities, uh, we select uh, randomly uh, representing the high elevation uh, culture uh, and also um, ecological zones to be uh, representing uh, the community, 12 uh, 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 villages. Uh, um, Total uh, participants, uh, 384 uh, participants. We use uh, remote sensing uh, analysis, legal uh, framework analysis, extensive uh, literature review. Next slide, please. So the result of uh, output one, fire extent. So we can see in the picture fire extent uh, more, most the area of the land in Timor Leste will get the fire. So it's almost no escape of uh, the area uh, from the fire. So you can see from uh, 2011, 2015, with the different color almost in the, the whole uh, land uh, were uh, uh, fire. And also starting from uh, the analysis of the, the satellite imagery, from 2016, 2020, also uh, most land was uh, 
fire. Uh, so this is the analysis of uh, uh, with the satellite imagery. Next slide, please. Uh, for the fire frequency, uh, we can you can see in the uh, uh, image from the data analysis from no fire to eight years, uh, eight years uh, uh, fire. So we can see how repeatedly the Barnet lands over a decade. So the biggest uh, portion of the land is Barnet once or twice in a, a decade. With a small portion of land is buried over five, over four to five years. So we can see this imagery, uh, almost none of uh, a land, no fire. So consistent with uh, with this last bar, our practice follow duration of two to four years up to ten to uh, fifteen years. Next slide, please. So from the uh, Output to field assessment using the fire, uh, of fire and communities. Uh, most of all the uh, villages, uh, community from two villages, say that uh, all agriculture, agriculture field, uh, they use fire for uh, for cleaning the land. Um, for uh, we have a oh, sorry, we have a four. We identify for uh, important uh, sources that are creating or or driving uh, fires: agriculture land, or forest or bush, pasture land, and also settlement. So, agriculture land mostly, mostly all of them they respond with uh, a use fire for agriculture. Uh, forestry uh, of few communities, uh, three of uh, twelve use fire for burning, but of course in all communities. Pasture land, five of 12 communities actively uh, use fire on pasture land. So in the, the intention to, uh, to create a new grasses for, for their uh, animals during the uh, dry season. Uh, settlement, seven of 12 uh, communities use fire uh, to uh, clear settlement uh, prior to the barn season so because uh, they want to prevent their uh, a settlement from the uh, wild uh, fire. Next slide, please. Uh, typical uh, field assessment uh, with the typical uh, duration after slash, slashing a new land. So the slope land, two to four years, uh, flat land up to seven years. So when they use uh, to cultivate, uh, to use the land continuously, uh, flat land, quite, the duration is quite longer, seven years compared with the uh, slope land. Uh, follow duration, two to four years, up to 10 to 15 years. Uh, so it's depend on uh, which type of land and uh, uh, the, with a typical slope or, uh, or flat land. 10 of uh, 12 uh, community think that uh, the follow period has uh, decreased over the past uh, 10 to uh, 20 years. Uh, why? Because uh, they also they provide uh, their idea, the answer that the population increase, uh, more um, uh, free animal grazing, uh, more uh, plantation uh, area. Uh, so they feel that the uh, follow period has decreased compared uh, in many years uh, before. Next slide, please. Um, key findings, uh, findings for the customary norms, uh, uh, 11 of 12 communities uh, assess that they feel that the uh, customary norms or they call it the Tarbando is exist, uh, but uh, they have also feel that the uh, um, customary norms not cover all, not cover um, fire management. So they feel um, fire customary norms cannot be used uh, forcefully for the fire management. A majority communities, nine of uh, 11 do not do not or only partial adhere to Tarabandu. So they feel that Tarabandu may be uh, exist, but uh, it's exist there, but they feel that it's not, it's very weak to, very weak uh, in the uh, enforcement. 
uh, so the, they feel that uh, the uh, customary norms. Next slide, please. From the field assessment, how uh, responses from a different view from women and youth. Women generally uh, share similar view with others, others uh, communities group. Uh, they can, uh, women uh, participate uh, in taking decision uh, with the men when they come to Schloss uh, New Land. So they take a part of the uh, decision to for the uh, open uh, new land. Um, women also work with uh, with men to implement barning and the Schloss and Barn. So new open land, women also take part uh, in, the, in the Schloss and, and Barn. Uh, but uh, they uh, feel, uh, women feel that uh, uh, they don't have any rule uh, in the specific rule in the customary um, norms. Uh, they feel so they don't have, uh, 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 they don't need to take action for any um, activities against the, the customary uh, norms. Uh, for the youth, normally uh, they provided the positive uh, uh, reasons that uh, they well aware of customer norms and practices. Generally, they check similar views with other communities, uh, same as uh, uh, women, uh, slightly more aware on the negative impacts of fire. So they really feel uh, fire happens. They, they feel the impacts uh, in the future more, perspective to sustainable farming practices introduced in their areas. If uh, there's a new practice that can help them uh, avoiding um, using fire on agriculture land. Next slide, please. Uh, for the uh, legal and policy framework, uh, there are several uh, key learnings, but some important key learnings that we pointed out here. Legal framework is uh, sufficient to act to our agriculture incidents and negative impacts of the slash and barn and uncontrolled fire. Legal framework uh, largely not enforced. As I mentioned before that it has been adjusted, but uh, it has not been um, uh, enforced. Uh, maybe we need a system to, to, uh, to enforce uh, this legal framework that has been developed. Policy framework not uh, aligned with the legal of some of our charters is not aligned with each other, so it's quite uh, difficult to be implemented. So uh, substantial uh, gaps uh, in the policy framework in reducing the incidence and the impact of slash and bar and control fire. Existing policies are not are mostly not implemented. They has, has been existed, but then mostly not uh, implemented. Need to develop a national strategy with the funding mechanism to reduce the incidence and address the negative impacts of slash and burn and uncontrolled fire. Next slide, please. So key drivers of fire, fire with, uh, with a purpose. They feel that by using fire, the, this, the message is from their ancestor. Agriculture land must be a barn. So this is the uh, message from the ancestor. Uh, they feel that uh, uh, fire, barn, agriculture land will provide the nutrient and uh, with, uh, with control and reducing the labor uh, cost, the uh, labor ability, uh, increase the population density and uh, reducing the following, regeneration of pasture land, uh, traditional uh, using fire for traditional hunting practices. In some places, uh, they, every year, they, uh, they burn the forests and bushes for, uh, for hunting purpose. Protecting house and villages limit, and they also, we also we discovered that uh, because of uh, limit of knowledge, they cannot control uh, uh, using the fire. Next slide, please. Uncontrolled fire events, uh, carless, they just uh, use fire. Some Julius or some people to just uh, burn just for the preserve. They ignore local uh, customary norms. 
they just they use fire and any place and they put the fire. It is just only for the pressure. Inadequate the government programs to promote the sustainable uh, practices, fire prevent and uh, fire control. Climate change, of course, increased the temperature and period of drought uh, resulting in dangerous fire and weather. So every year uh, we can see uh, fire in almost in everywhere. Next slide, please. So way forward, uh, we, we think for this study, we think that the communication uh, promoting behavior change, communication is important, training and education, implement the Tarbandu or uh, uh, customer norms in the smallest case, uh, small scale even has been uh, existing in the um, villages or sub villages or uh, in the smaller community, but uh, we need to implement in the in the small uh, scale to be uh, really uh, um, control at uh, how the uh, customer norms can work uh, to reduce uh, uh, fire. That's a demonstration and a scale up alternative land management practices through farmer field school as a good approach to be to be used. In ancient government the strategies and the programs, law and regulation enforcement. Uh, national strategy to reduce fire and its negative impact. National program to reduce fire incidents and its negative impact. Uh, so, priority intervention areas for the government there are three important: so finance, uh, finance of course, the implementation of national strategy through concrete uh, program and uh, projects, contribution uh, from from and uh, coordination with the several national institutions like uh, Minister of Agriculture, um, the other uh, relevant institution, Minister of State uh, Station, uh, Environment, and other. Uh, and uh, policy as well. Uh, this is a good to build a policy and uh, 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 partners uh, with the national and international. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, uh, study uh, was uh, well conducted because support uh, get support from the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries of uh, Timor Leste. Next slide, please. Yes, I think that's all uh, my presentation, and thank you very much for all of you to listen to my thank, presentation. Thank you thank very you. much, Dr. Claudine. Um, the, re the report that you saw um, illustrated on, I think, the second or third slide is available publicly. So if you're interested in looking at a, at a very systematic and complete review and analysis of a country's situation, uh, I urge you to, to have a look at it. We now have a, a, another virtual presentation. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Ivan Vasilovich Sovetnikov, the head of the Russian Forest Service, is not able to join us. But um, Maria Sokolenko, I think, are you there? Yes, good morning, Peter, colleagues. Good morning, Maria. Thank you very much for uh, stepping in and for making this presentation and for all the arrangements, and particularly for getting up at a very early hour of the morning. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you, Peter. I uh, hope you can all hear me well. And uh, uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, good afternoon and good morning to those participants who, like me, are joining the session early in the morning. It's five in the morning in Moscow. I uh, indeed apologize that Mr. Savitnikov wasn't able to take part in this forum today due to his urgent mission to another region of Russia. My name is Maria Sokolenko and uh, I represent the uh, Department of Science and International Cooperation at the Federal Forestry Agency of Russia. I would like to start with expressing gratitude to the FAO and Republic of Korea for dedicating this forum to the important issue of wildfires. This issue is uh, very important for our country and while we are having this forum now, uh, our colleagues are fighting the fires in several regions of the Russian Federation. These are not first fires this year. And this is one of the important trends I would uh, like to draw your attention to. It seems that uh, fire seasons don't exist anymore on the ground. Fires appear all year round. 
As far as I know, this situation is observed in uh, some other countries of the world as well. In Russia, we are monitoring fires all year round and we see first fires in early January and uh, uh, last fires, so to say, in the end of December, which both are mid-winter in Russia. Still spring and um, especially summer fires are, of course, most lasting and most intensive. Fire can spread um, around thousands of hectares, can jump over roads and rivers, escape firefighting services in remote areas and uh, steep mountainous uh, terrains. But of course, we realize that forest ecosystems have much longer history than the history of forest protection services. Forests are adapted to fires. This is also true for the taiga, for the boreal forests that are natural for Russia. Fire is a natural phenomenon which is critical for the healthy functioning of forest ecosystems. And uh, uh, the authors of the recent UNEP report highlight this idea too. I think we uh, will get more information about the UNEP um, report a little bit later today. Um, we believe that uh, this uh, science-based understanding of um, natural um, background and phenomenon of fires is something which is um, usually lost in the piles of media articles and photos of fires, flames and smoke. An um, area covered by fires, so I mean the territory touched by the flames, touched by the fire, is not equal to the area of forest killed by the fires. Um, what I mean is forest fire is not a synonym to forest death. And I am confident that all the colleagues um, who are um, participating in the forum understand that. But of course, we um, should uh, make um, better use of communication when uh, um, discussing this problem with um, our population, with general public. Uh, most forests survive fires and uh, trees have uh, their natural tools to protect themselves and moreover flames are necessary for some species to regenerate. But should we ignore fires? Of course no. Probably the right way would be to learn to live with them. Our approach in Russia is to make comprehensive analysis about management of the fires. Um, fire management is embedded in the federal projects, as well as in the national strategy of the Russian Federation. We have the Federal Interagency Center, um, who coordinates the national activities and fire management, including preparatory work and firefighting. Um, approaches to fire management vary, depending on how um, dense the population in the area is, on the nature and climate features of the region, on landscape specifics, as well as on infrastructure. Um, so in our country, we have uh, planning and zoning systems and the firefighting in each zones has its specific and of course its challenges. Uh, one example, um, remote forests no access by road, what are the key criteria for decision-making regards fires? Uh, firefighting is a must if a fire poses a threat to towns, uh, to other human settlements or to economic entities. Um, but it is a little bit of a different story if we speak about remote territories with no human settlements. In that case, we should proceed from analyzing potential threat to fighters, firefighters themselves, to the lives of people who fight fires. Um, we should compare forecasted damage with fire and um, uh, expected bonuses and costs of firefighting. So in plain words, uh, how uh, much does it cost to fight fires? And um, is it equal or exceeds the expected um, damage of uh, fire itself? 
Um, uh, the system of decision making uh, is uh, very strict. Um, it is multi agency, so it is not only uh, about federal forestry agency, there are other ministries and agencies um, involved, and it includes authorities from both federal and regional centers. So, this is um, our approach to response. Um, as far as zoning and planning are concerned, um, here, science is a great tool and a great help, but <clears throat> it is not something cement-grounded. It is living and evolving, because um, we have to adapt and adjust to fires. Another trend I would like to draw your attention to is um, fire in high latitudes, for example, fires in the Arctic. As we see from the UNEP report, temperatures rise unevenly around the globe. Speed of temperature rise um, also differs in different zones um, of um, the world. In Russia, we observe more fires in high latitude areas, so those um, latitudes, they are higher. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Peter. Um, so, uh, yes, following my um, comment about um, fires in high latitude, I would like to say that this is not on the only influence of climate change. The climate change influences the rainfall, distribution of precipitation, intensity and frequency of fires and winds. So again, what is the response? In our case, uh, like uh, in case of other colleagues, and Joshua, I suppose, mentioned it earlier today, um, we make use of uh, space and aerial monitoring. Um, besides, uh, um, there are new firefighting bases and tools, improved mobility of aerial firefighting services. Here I'm speaking um, about both uh, smoke jumpers and aviation. As you may know, our uh, helicopters and planes are help for wildfires, not only uh, in Russia, but in other countries of the world. Um, the UNEP report placed specific focus on preparatory work and prevention. And of course, we can only agree about that. Um, fire prevention measures include creating infrastructure, fire breaks, ensuring water supply. Um, silviculture approaches include consideration of specific features for forest restoration and land management, um, land development. Uh, this is something which is connected uh, to so-called climate smart forestry. So again, we can see that everything is pretty much connected. Fire management, uh, forestry, silviculture. Education and uh, forest-friendly upbringing in general are of great importance, as well as spread of knowledge about how to prevent fires, how to survive, uh, in case of fire, how to behave with fire, so how to live with this. Um, this upbringing um, from the very early age of human life is a huge and a vital investment in decreasing risks of wildfires. And I stay ready to give you an example of our work in this field. Um, science. Forest fires are changing. Um, so, forest virology is a living science as well. In Russia, we continue studies of fire behavior and um, multilateral consequences and influences of fires. Our model allows for comprehensive analysis of fire, forest fire behavior, for forest fire consequences. And these studies help to forecast and model fire situations in the future. This is vital for saving lives of people and minimizing harm for environment. We believe that this is uh, one uh, um, field where international community can cooperate more. Of course, there are more fields and more directions of cooperation, um, but exchange of experience and uh, multilateral, multilateral research can help adapt and successfully manage fires. Um, in conclusion, I would like to again um, express gratitude to the organizers uh, for holding this interesting and very important forum. Um, 
by uh, some reason, um, the agenda of international forest processes usually uh, lack um, themes of fires. So personally, I'm involved in very many processes of uh, UN Economic Commission for Europe, FAO, UN Forum on Forests, etc., etc., uh, balance cooperation, and we see that fires is not the first priority for the forest society, for the International Forest Society, which is uh, usually a question, at least for, 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 for me. Um, I'm confident that today's event and understanding will uh, uh, help to improve the situation, and uh, we would really love how to continue working on forest fires. Uh, we we'll look forward to new opportunities and uh, uh, ways to exchange experience with colleagues from international academia, policymakers, and practitioners. So, thank you a lot for your attention, and um, I will be glad to answer your possible questions. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Maria. And I think um, one of the reasons that we're having this forum is to is to take advantage of some of the the, the negative uh, and high-profile events that have happened in the recent years, but also to, to place fires a bit more internationally on the stage. And we've certainly seen and heard from some presentations this morning that help us to do that. Um, thank you again for, uh, for attending, Maria, and um, I look forward to keeping in contact and participating globally in, in fire management. Our final presentation for the morning is from Mr. Elena Paredes Hernandez, Hernandez Paredes, I'm sorry about that, Elena. Uh, who's the Head of Service for the Forest Fire Protection Department in the Ministry for Ecology, Transition and Demographic Change Challenge in Spain. Uh, Eleanor, are you online? Uh, yes, Peter. Hello. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, I can. We can hear you very well. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. We'll get your, your presentation is up, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks to you, uh, Peter, and thank you, thanks to the organization for inviting us to, to share our experiences on, on this topic that I will be presenting, presenting today. And here I will focus on, on different experiences and the potential benefits that we have identified and that we've been learning for many years already within the framework of two working groups. Is, uh, next slide, please. Is um, the working group, the expert group on forest fires uh, that is coordinated by the, uh, the General Directorate of Environment of the European Commission and the Joint Research Center. And also the working group uh, one on forest fires of Silva Mediterranea of FAO. Uh, Silva Mediterranea is a FAO statutory body and works as a committee of Mediterranean forestry questions. These two working groups have uh, several similarities, also some differences. Um, they follow similar objectives. Um, they are not response focused groups. This is important to, to highlight. They are mainly integrated by national forest or forest fire services uh, focal points, and they have regular meetings. Um, they are integrated in these two working groups. Uh, they, we have uh, integrate, integrated all Mediterranean members, both from European and non-European uh, countries. And it's important to understand that with these two working groups, uh, we are addressing a regional approach, not just a continent uh, at continent level, but regionally, which we think is, is very important. Um, of course, uh, there are continents, of course, there are countries, but the, the, as we see it, the, the right approach to deal with forest fires internationally is uh, the regional approach where we all share the uh, same challenges and, and same uh, priorities, let's say. But there are also um, differences between these two groups that I will try to explain to. Uh, one of them being that the expert group on, on forest fires coordinated by the European Commission um, 
has a stronger financial support for meetings, uh, while the Silver Mediterranean Working Group relies more on uh, secretariat support, but um, not so strong financially in order to, to address the different meetings of the working group. And also the expert group of the European Commission, it's a well-established group in terms of the meetings. Uh, we meet twice a year always before and after the wildfire season here in, in Europe, that is uh, our summer. Uh, While well, the working group one meets um, not under established calendar, we meet uh, when we need to meet, we meet to address relevant um, issues. And of course, we try to create synergies and meet when other events are taking place uh, side by side. To, to get the most of, of our meetings. Um, this is important, the synergies that uh, all working groups need to create and that we try to create with other initiatives, initiatives and actions, taking into account uh, also to achieve a, a better approach to our common problems and also looking after a most cost efficient effort. This is very important. Um, to highlight uh, recently there are many initiatives going on. The interest on wildfires is growing uh, globally. So I think we need to also stop here and try to use what we have on the table regarding working groups and, and different initiatives of meeting internationally and, and try to use them and look for the synergies among them instead of, of creating new ones. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So let me explain a little bit about the expert group on, on forest fires of the the environment. Uh, it was created and set up in 1998, almost uh, when on the way of 20 years ago. It's a joint effort of the national services and the European Commission services too. Uh, currently, it's integrated by 43 countries from Europe, Middle East and North Africa. It deals with national environmental and forestry administrations. And as I said, it meets uh, twice a year. There are some countries uh, that are not colored in the map and those are not members uh, in most of the cases because they don't have uh, any forest fire or wildfire related um, issues. Can I have the next slide, please? And regarding the different experiences of this working group that has been um, on the table for many years already, this is one of the things I would like to share with you. It's one of the main achievements of this working group, and it's the result of the, of the commitment and the effort, the joint effort of all the countries. The European Forest Fire Information System, it's a great network and, and it's uh, coordinated by the European Commission. But at the beginning, um, it included just a European countries, a European Commission member states. But uh, we identified within the working group and of course the Commission itself that there was no point of limiting the European Forest Information System just to Europe, because as I said, we are part of a region which is more than, than a continent, more than countries in terms of addressing uh, wildfire problems or uh, relevant aspects. So in 2011, um, after this being uh, highlighted and identified as a priority, a workshop with the support of the FAO was launched uh, with all countries of North Africa and Middle East. And in this, in this workshop, it was, uh, I mean, these countries, the new, uh, the countries that were going to be the new members of EFIS, uh, they also um, agreed with the relevance of adapting their national forest data collection systems in order to be able to share the data with, with among all the region and be able to compare those data. And also they identify the relevance of being part and integrate themselves in an exchange of information network, such as EFIS. 
So what we did is that we created uh, binomials uh, of countries with a uh, vast experience on FEs and these new countries coming from these other regions. And we were working side by side. For example, Spain worked with Morocco, Italy with Algeria to, to address a detailed analysis with the national focal point on the data collect collection procedures and how to use that data in addressing the following steps to ensure their integration in the network. Um, let me also mention that since 2015, FIS is under the European Union Copernicus Program Emergency Management Service. Well, uh, next, slide, next slide, please. As you can see, this was achieved and, uh, and these countries are part of the, of the network of EFIS and within the EFIS platform where you have different tools that are very interesting where you can um, try to, to look for burn surface, a number of fires, fire related news and of course statistics in general. And as you can see um, in the interface of this uh, of EFIS that is shown in this slide, uh, all these countries from from uh, the Middle East and the North Africa and North Africa are integrated already, and statistics on them can be can be shown. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. And here you can see, maybe it's, it's too small to be seen, but what I try to, to show in this slide is that uh, at the beginning, and it's the way we have evolved, and it's, it's the way that shows uh, once again uh, the approach, the regional approach that we need. EFIS started uh, publishing reports uh, on wildfire or forest fires in the region in 2020. And as you can see at the beginning, it was just focused on the Southern um, European countries, which are the ones that we historically have um, more events. Um, so this was just at the very beginning. Then um, very fast it evolved in, in focusing in the, whole, in the whole Europe at the beginning, once again, just in the fire season or fire campaign. But then very fast, uh, it was noticed that uh, it didn't make um, the, it wasn't uh, appropriate because what we need is to have a wider scope for the, for the subject. So as you can see, then we started uh, to have these technical reports annually. Uh, focusing not just in the southern Mediterranean countries, in the southern European countries, sorry, not just in the summer campaign, but in the whole um, continent. And later on, after this initiative of ex extending uh, the European Forest Fire Information System to the whole region, since 2011, all these countries are also part of the report. In these reports, all the countries we have to provide a, our annual data on forest fires and it's um, a great report to understand the reality of, of our region. Next slide, please. Um, I, will, I also wanted to, to mention this, this um, workshop that took place after the 2011 one because it's very related to it and because the subject is very important. Uh, what we noticed uh, when we had the workshop on the extension of EFIS, trying to have as much uh, as information, statistics, information on the subject and the more harmonized possible information on their EFIS, we realized that there was a lack uh, of data and procedures on forest fire causes investigation. So this, uh, I, I'm sure that you all agree with me, this is a root. I mean, if we don't understand uh, the problem itself, if we, if we don't understand the causes of wildfires or forest fires in our countries, we cannot move forward on developing our systems and our policies and our priorities. So we held uh, another workshop and the year after in 2012, to exchange experiences and best practices in forest fire causes investigation. 
of course, to facilitate the integration of these countries in EFIS, but also because within Europe, within uh, EFIS itself, uh, we it was identified that we needed um, a classification on forest fire causes to to harmonize the data so and that we could all speak the same language in this regard and we could all compare data um, properly so that's what we did and it was also a great a great initiative of this expert group and um, next slide please thank you about the other other reports, other documents, other initiatives that we that we work on within the expert group, I wanted to share this one, which is the latest one. It's a, a land-based wildfire prevention a report in which, once again, all countries we have contributed, and for for more than a year we've been uh, working on different drafts, and then uh, the final version was approved. In this document, we we gather principle and ex principles and experiences on managing landscapes, forests, and woodlands for safety and resilience in Europe. Um, I encourage uh, you to to read it. It's possible, you can download it from the European Commission uh, web page, and it's let's say the last effort of the of the group as a working group, like an expert group itself. Um, next slide, please. Now let me talk a, a little bit about this other working group, this other initiative we have in the region. Um, this goes back back in time. In indeed, instead, uh, in 1911, it was in 1911 when the idea of Mediterranean forestry cooperation was launched, and in 1922. A Mediterranean Forestry League was established under the name of Silva Mediterranean. So we're talking about 100 years ago. But it was in 1948 when Silva Mediterranean evolved into an FAO, a statutory body, as a committee of Mediterranean forestry questions, where the Mediterranean member countries of the European Forestry Commission the Near East Forestry Commission and the African Forestry and Wildlife Commission could meet, share experiences and establish cooperative programs. So in 2002, the committee proposed that the research networks that were established at the beginning within Silva Mediterranea uh, phased out uh, and be replaced by, by working groups, working groups with a specific mandate and clear objectives, outputs, and time frames. And this was this was done in order to have more effects, effective alliances to with other institutions working in the Mediterranean region. So this working group uh, on forest fires is one of the current uh, working groups of Silva Mediterranea. Um, I wanted to to show with this slide that uh, up to now. We have uh, had four uh, work plans, the last uh, from 2021 to 2024 that I will explain in a following slide. But I also wanted to highlight in this slide that um, the different years of the International Warfare Conferences. Uh, why? Because since this is uh, the most relevant forum at international level, level on wildfires, uh, Let's, let's mention that all regions within these wildfire conferences, we have the opportunity to share and explain the main challenges in our region and also to identify um, our priority areas of work. And later on uh, within the forum, I also have, will have the chance to present the last uh, Mediterranean regional region statement on wildfires. This working group is coordinated by Spain, but also co-led by Turkey. And this is very strategic because, um, as you know, Spain is within the, the west of the Mediterranean and Turkey is within the east of the Mediterranean. So this is a strong uh, coordination and, and leadership of this working group. Next slide, please. 
Okay, here I I wanted to just to show some of the some of the different initiatives in which in which the working group is working. Just to mention some, um, one of them being uh, our contribution contribution uh, to the state of Mediterranean forest. Whenever there's a publication on this regard, we uh, the court, the working group one we support the chapter on on forest fires in this in this document. Also, um, just to mention that uh, lately in the last uh, Mediterranean forest weeks, the Mediterranean forest weeks um, are a common regional platform for cooperation on Mediterranean forest, uh, aiming at improving the dialogue between the Mediterranean forest research community, policymakers, and the rest of relevant stakeholders, as well as at communicating to the international community and the society at large, the relevance and challenges affecting the Mediterranean forest. So within the Mediterranean forest weeks, this working group uh, has promoted two side events in the, um, a sixth Mediterranean Forest Week that took place in 2019 in Lebanon, we promoted a side event on prevention and restoration on forest fires, linking actions before and after fire. We wanted to highlight this because most, most of the time or many times we're focusing on the wildfire event itself, when it's happening, the response, the emergency. But of course, prevention and restoration as, 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 as well as important as response. And we think it's uh, needed, uh, there's a need to link prevention actions and restoration actions. And with restorations after wildfires, we have great opportunities and challenges to work on prevention too. This side event took place in 2019, as I said. And uh, very recently, in March uh, this year, in Turkey, uh, in the seventh Mediterranean Forest Week, we promoted another side event uh, on resilient landscapes, safe communities, and we were talking about innovative practices for integrated fire management in the Mediterranean. Uh, these side events were also promoted with other organizations. In this case, it was uh, along with the European Forest Institute, EFI. And one of the main objectives of this last, last uh, side event was the update of the document. One of the documents you also see on the slide is the wildfire prevention in the Mediterranean position paper uh, that was approved in 2011 so already 10 years ago, and we're working on the update of this document. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Um, also, one of the main outcomes of this working group is the statement of the Mediterranean region that is presented, as I said previously, in the wildfire conferences. The last was presented in 2019 in the conference that took place in in Brazil, and we are working already in the new statement that will be presented in the next wildfire conference that will take place next year in Portugal. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, here I wanted to share with you the current work plan of our working group. Uh, it has these four main sections. Uh, being the first one uh, focusing on wildfire prevention, reducing risk while increasing preparedness. This section has different lines of actions. Uh, lines of action, uh, for example, one is, is the update of the position paper on wildfire prevention in the Mediterranean that I just mentioned. Another one is related to the development of Mediterranean guidelines for controlled and prescribed uh, burns management. Uh, one of the other lines of action is ensuring the coordination on this regard and facilitate knowledge and experience uh, experiences exchanges. There's another section uh, that deals with suppression, of course. And I said this before, the working groups are uh, mainly focused on 
prevention, environmental aspects, and so on. But we cannot forget suppression. Uh, we need to take into, into consideration all phases of, of wildfires. Uh, and regarding suppression, our main focus and our main uh, lines of actions here is to work uh, for a better interoperability of resources, a better sharing of resources, and to do this, uh, we believe that we need to work in common standard procedures and protocol protocols. We have to share what we have, and we have to say, we have to see where we can merge and we can, where we can converge. Uh, so when the fire and the emergency takes place, and we know that we all need support from each other, and we support from each other during the emergency, when this happens, we coordinate better and in a more safe, a safety, in a more safe and efficient way, which is crucial. Uh, another main section, it's about international cooperation itself. I, we believe that preparedness and reinforcing preparedness is it's key also. We need to share knowledge and experiences among our countries. And we also need to collaborate with other regions uh, in the world. Uh, of course, this working group takes into consideration synergies with other regions that also have Mediterranean uh, climate uh, related. Uh, for example, uh, Chile in South America, some regions of Australia, in the United States, uh, California with Mediterranean vegetation. So we, we, we work on, on these links globally, which is very important too. And, and last but not least, uh, there's a section uh, focused on research, on coordinated research on providing answers to the end users' needs. Because um, as I said, there are many, many initiatives going on. Research is, is I mean, mandatory. It's there, we have great researchers, great lines of research, but sometimes still we have evolved and we have evolved in a good way in the, in the last uh, re recent years. But still, um, sometimes there is this lack of, of coordination between the research and what the end users need. And to do so, to try to, to bridge this gap, we think that uh, partners and end users need to participate within these research and development projects. Uh, and it's very important to participate from the beginning um, to, to better align uh, the results of the research to have results that are um, effective and that will be used uh, and that they are, are better coordinated with the needs. Uh, also, we think that we should participate and promote uh, knowledge and technology transfer initiatives. And, and the key, some of the key drivers that we see within for the research community as, as managers, as policymakers, uh, which is the institution I represent, is, um, are the social, landscape and economic drivers of wildfires. These are very important drivers. Also, we, within the work plan, we consider the cooperation with other working groups within Silva Mediterranean. Next slide, please. Okay, in this, uh, my last slide, I wanted to focus on the potential benefits of having these working groups. And here I'm talking to, I'm going to talk both about the potential benefits of the expert group on forest fires and the working group one. These are platforms, great platforms, open platforms to exchange and debate uh, on wildfires. And just saying so, it's, it's just that is a great, great benefit. Uh, to have this, this forum. But um, in addition to this, while we work together within these working groups and expert groups, we tend and to work on a standardized information, on a standardized procedures and protocols. Of course, um, we are not going to have the same, exactly the same, but the more we exchange information and experiences, the more we know each other, the better we're going to collaborate 
in all the phases of wildfires and the more confident we're going to be on each other. And we, this is, for example, crucial in order to exchange resources, um, wildfire suppression resources, to trust in each other and to trust in each other, we have to know each other. So these forums are, these working groups are great opportunities for this to build up that trust. Okay. Also, if we better know um, about wildfires in the region and not just in our countries or not just with our neighboring countries, we're going to better understand itself uh, the wildfires. So we will be in a better position ourselves within our countries to deal with it. And of course, a uh, as the results of these working groups and expert groups, what we have are recommendations for policymakers, for managers, for the research community itself, itself, and all these recommendations are are great and um, also results uh, to to internationally try to work uh, for a better approach. Uh, to this common challenge that we that we have. Uh, next slide, please. All right, here what I wanted to share are also some some lessons learned and areas of improvement, of course, that we face within these these working groups. Um, the potential is huge. We have many different countries working together. Mm, people that are very ex very expert with lots of expertise and background but still sometimes we identify that the results are still limited and of course this is because of many reasons being one of them that we are all dedicated to our day day-to-day -day work within our countries and also there's we need to find time to work on these common um, objectives that we have within this working groups and expert groups. Of course, uh, the, the role of the secretariat in these groups is very, very important. It needs to be a strong secretariat for a systematic promotion of activities, creating those work dynamics that we need and motivating to produce results. Um, sometimes, let's say, also it's a challenge and it happens everywhere. People are changing positions, uh, things are being um, remodelating within governments uh, in every country. So sometimes it's, this also affects the dynamics within the working groups, but this is normal and we need to, we need to cope with it. But it's, it's something that it's there and it also affects. Um, of course, the network focal points is of utmost importance. Uh, it has to be active, it has to be complete, and uh, the focal points need to be very well identified. Um, another area of, imp of improvement uh, is the financing of activities. For example, uh, I said it at the beginning, uh, within the European Commission, there's a financial line for the expert group on forest fires that supports uh, traveling, for example, and logistics for the meetings. Uh, but for example, within the um, working group of FAO, Silva Mediterranean Network, uh, this working group has a secretariat, but uh, for the meetings or other activities, we have to rely of our on our national projects and also on financial resources from related organizations and donors. But this also is being taken place. And, and just to mention the way, the different way of working that is also a, a challenge. Yes. Can I just ask you to finish up? Yes, there's just one more slide. Sure. Um, let's go to the to the next one, please, which will be the last one. And just some reflections to finish my presentation uh, in general wildfires that we consider is a cross-cutting nature um, event uh, that we need to keep working on integrating experts and organizations from other sectors. Just to mention some on the slide, uh, we need to reduce the potential development of extreme events and its consequences uh, by working on a strategic fuel management, increase the resistance and resilience of population and the landscape itself, and of course, uh, keep in mind that response is not the answer, 
So we need to keep working on solving the imbalance between prevention and response. And that would be it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, one of the things that, that was mentioned a few times this morning, and I think we need to keep in mind, is that connection. It's wonderful that we're all able to be here physically, but not all of us. Uh, and that's one of the things we need to try and create. We need to create opportunities and we need, as Eleanor was mentioning, to sustain them so that you know it's annual or it's a couple of times a year. We'll now take a break for lunch until 10 past one. After lunch, there's some very interesting presentations, two more from Korea uh, and then one from Thailand. And then we have a couple of round table events with UNEP and others. So we'll see you back here at 10 minutes past one. Thank you very much. Okay, distinguished guests and colleagues, uh, your attention for a moment, please. We'll, we'd like to kindly ask all the guests to have take your seats because we'll begin shortly. Okay, everyone is here now. So we'll now commence today's ceremony. Com Good afternoon, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the launching ceremony of the AFOCO AKCF Cooperation Project entitled Capacity Building on Enhancing Resilience to Forest Fire and Local Livelihood and Market Linkages. I am Yongju Han of the AFOCO Secretariat and MC of the today's event. Now, I'd like to introduce our distinguished representatives from the two implementing organizations of the project. Please welcome Mr. Ricardo Carter, Executive Director of Asian Forest Cooperation Organization. <laughs> Next, we have Ms. Femi Pinto, ED, Executive Director of Non-Timber Forest Product Exchange Program Asia. And we are also joined by four guests from NTFPEP. And we also have four countries who will implement the project in the field. Mr. Chu Bang Mi, Deputy Director of Department of Forestry and Community Forestry from Cambodia. <laughs> we have Mr. Savan Chanchu Kamune, Director of Planning and Cooperation Division from Lao PDR. And we have Ms. Yi Munse, Deputy Chief of Mission, Embassy of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar. <laughs> Lastly, we have Mr. Lu Tiam Nat, Senior Officer, Vietnam Ministry of Forestry, Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development of Vietnam. And now I'd like to invite Ms. Femi Pinto, Executive Director from NTFP EP Asia for her remarks. Please give her a big hand. Good afternoon. Um, I hope that everyone is finding the Congress fruitful, learning a lot, and in your fire management forum, doing your networking and making new connections or reconnecting since it had taken us quite a while, almost two years without physical event, much less participating in a big event like this. Um, I had to reorient myself again how these things go. It is my honor and privilege on behalf of the Project Management Committee, led by our dear partner, the Asian Forest Cooperation Organization, under the leadership of my fellow Filipino Executive Director, um, Ricardo Calderon, with his strong team, Sir Orly Panganiban, Dr. Kikang Bay, uh, Mr. Sung Ho Choi, and the rest of the team, and of course, our esteemed delegates and members from the Cambodia, Lao, PDR, Myanmar, and Vietnam Forestry Ministries, or who are here and have engaged with us. The life of this project is interesting, and it brings together two important aspects of intervention, to contribute to address main threats and challenges faced in the forestry sector today. 
and of local communities, including of indigenous peoples that are stewards of the forest and also embarking on key livelihoods and forest enterprises. Um, the, the project entitled Capacity Building and um, Enhancing Resilience to Forest Fire and Local Livelihood and Market Linkages um, will include many activities in the next um, three years, um, including regional activities, capacity development activities, and um, these regional activities will be mainly conducted by our participating organizations, yourselves, your teams, um, and there will be uh, several national workshops, regional workshops, and training courses along the way. Um, lastly, there will also be a, a uh, structures within the project that will hold, also ensure that uh, the, the project will be smoothly running and engaging everyone uh, as actively as possible. Um, we are grateful for the um, support of AFOCO itself for the counterpart funds, but uh, primarily also with for the um, thanks also to the ASEAN Korea Cooperation Fund or AKCF and the facilitation of the ASEAN Secretariat together with the team at the Food, Agriculture and Forestry Division and the Secretariat of the ASEAN Working Group on Sustainable Forest Management and Working Group on Social Forestry. We give our profound thanks. We have uh, this project has been in, in development for at least maybe two or three years. And so we are really happy and uh, thank, thank everyone and are very enthusiastic to go ahead. We are greatly pleased that we could begin the work. So with that, I am happy to um, be part of this, this launch and give you all thanks and a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Pinto. Then we'd like to proceed with an acknowledgement of the four project implementing countries together with Mr. Ricardo Carderon and Ms. Femi Pinto. So please make your way to the front. All the representatives from each country, please make your way to the front for a good ball. Thank you very much. This marks the end of the ceremony. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ki Kang Bae uh, from Asian Forest Corporation Organization. Uh, it's an honor for me to be your moderator for this afternoon session. The first session of this afternoon, uh, we have uh, three speakers uh, who will introduce you to new and very innovative tools to manage forest fire effectively and efficiently. I'd like to uh, call on our first speaker, Mr. Kim Manju, uh, from Manager of Forest Register Control Center of Republic of Korea, who was expected to be the speaker for this session, but unfortunately could not join uh, the forum due to the, the fire situation currently occurring in Korea. However, uh, to have in his uh, place, we have Mr. Chae byung -san from the same division who will deliver the presentation. Mr. Chae, please. It is great to be here. I work at the Korea Forest Service 
at the Forest Fire Prevention and Control Division. My name is Che byung Sun. As was aforementioned, we were supposed to have uh, Mr. Kim man Manager of Forest Disaster Control Center of Korea, but because of very dry weather in Korea and uh, we are expected to have very strong winds in the EC area of Korea. So that is why I am here on behalf of Mr. Kim man -ju. Today, I will be going over Korean forest fire response system. As you know, Korea has a very advanced IT system using IT technology. I would like to introduce to you how we are utilizing the IT technology to deal with wildfire. I would like to introduce to you our system and Korea forest fire response and then come to a conclusion. On the right side, you can see that in Korea, 64% of the land is forested. That is why we needed a forest fire response system optimized for Korea. In many cases, we use helicopters to put out fires and use drones. And on the ground, many people are working very hard to fight forest fires. You can see the different types of firefighters in Korea. And here, you can see our patrol. And for these forest fire patrols or rangers, they are monitoring the different forest fires in different regions. And you can see uh, we have the different uh, firefighters and we have uh, people that are using helicopters. And they are similar to smoke jumpers in the US. So these are the people that utilize helicopters and in the other countries we see a lot of firefighters uh, that extinguish the forest fires and we have a uh, Korea Forest Service uh, yeah, that actually is engaged in a lot of this uh, fire extinguishing and we also have firefighters that play a slight different role. You can see that we have 49 helicopters in KFS and these extinguish a lot of the fires in Korea. You might think that they're too uh, small in number, but we have local government's helicopters, which are about 73. So we cooperate to put out fires. You can see in Daejeon, a city in Korea, we have the forest fire headquarter. At the headquarter, we have 24 hour, 365 day monitoring for forest fires. You can see that the different related organization have different data. So using IT, we accumulate the data. You can see, for example, we have the different national positioning system data, land parcel aerial photos, and we have data about cultural heritage and all of that is monitored and this is needed because when we have a forest fire, we believe what is most important is to know about the situation on the ground. And in order to analyze the situation, there is this basic data which is put into a system and we engage in the monitoring. We have prevention activities in the beginning and then after fires are reported, we would analyze and react. In case of a forest fire, we also let uh, Korean people know, ask them to evacuate in the nearby areas. And for local autonomous governments, we also communicate with them so that people can be evacuated very safely. This is a system that came up in the morning session. And you can see that we have forest fire forecasting system. You can see that it looks at many um, weather conditions and uh, topographical conditions, and it always predicts per hour what will happen in the case of forest fires and where it, there is a high predictability. So we would 
see, for example, if there are illegal um, incineration attempts, we would uh, go and we would monitor those activities and we would need to stop them if needed. So this is uh, what we are engaging in. This is the next stage and this is when we have the reports of forest fires that are relate to us. So I told you about the patrols or rangers and they have mobile devices and they would take pictures of the site and then they would send these pictures to the HQ and then they will look at the pictures and they would know how much of fire extinguishing is needed. After that, we have apps, citizen apps that can also uh, give us information about forest fires and we have 119, a national emergency number and KFS connects to the 119 system in the case of forest fires. So we are able to respond to forest fires using this type of system. Sorry for that. You can see this is how people would report forest fires. You, you would take a picture using your smartphone or cell phone and you would send that picture. After that, you can see that we would have an alarm going off in the headquarters and then we would see the picture. So the people in the control room would not need to visit the site and they would actually see what is going on through the different surveillance cameras and other types of equipment. Now we would make a decision about how to deal with the situation. We would have information sharing to know how many people would be needed and how much of fire extinguishing capabilities would be needed. We have a uh, different analysis using photos from our helicopters and drones and others and we would uh, see and predict the situation and we have the forest fire um, prediction system by the Korea Forest Service National Institute of Forest Service and we would predict uh, how the forest fires could spread. After all of this is analyzed, we would see how many people would be needed and what would be needed. So we would uh, see the helicopter numbers or the numbers of people that are needed on the ground. In a forest fire, what is most important is the safety of people because people's lives are of utmost importance. That is why using real-time apps, we will let people know about the location of the forest fires and we will let them know where to evacuate. You can see in Korea, we have broadcasting channels and we would let the broadcasting channels know about the situation about the forest fires in real time so that people could evacuate in time. So this is a video and when we have the report coming in for the forest fire, we would make an analysis using the different photos and other data and we would get prepared to utilize our helicopters. After that, we have people on the ground that would go to the site and we have the aerial fire fighting unit and the helicopters would be on their way to put out the fire. And before the helicopter arrives, people on the ground would make preparations. We would use our water resources and they would initially uh, extinguish the fire and we use drones a lot too so that uh, they would also use water to have initial extinguishment and this is aerosol so we use drones like uh, we have the fire extinguishers at home so this is uh, just used in the initial phases. You can see the helicopters and when they go to the site, you can see uh, the rafales that are uh, used. So they go down and they would put out fires. And after that, the helicopters would go to a area with water and it would fill up with water.
and after that it would go to the fire site and then it would use water to extinguish the fire. And these are videos of real forest fires that occurred this year. And this is very dangerous because the helicopter pilots, it's very hard for them to see because uh, their views are obscured because of the smoke. It, however, they will risk their lives to put out the fires for the safety of people's lives in Korea. We have six of this equipment, S-64 helicopter from the U.S. There is a water cannon, and there is another piece of equipment that lets us have water coming in from the bottom of the helicopter. This is a forest fire in, uh, that occurred in Ulsan about two years ago, and many helicopters are now being used to put out the fire, to have suppression of the fire. In some cases, we may need to extinguish fires at night, and we would use drones in order to find out the location of the forest fire, and we would have our fighter fighters who would go to the sites. You can see uh, the infrared and you can see the smoke coming in from the forest fire and you can see uh, the infrared cameras that are filming the location of the forest fire. After this is detected, then we would have the firefighters going to the site. And I mentioned that aerosols and they're also being used at night to put out fires. And this is a helicopter called Suriho in Korea, and it is made in Korea, and we use it for nighttime suppression. However, it is very hard for our pilots to see at night to get the view, so this is only used on a, a very rare case. I would like to continue with my explanation about the Korean forest fire situation control system. And you can see this screen and we have the many reports coming in for different forest fires. We have the mobile devices of our rangers or others that lets us receive these reports. And then we would look at the situation and analyze looking at the weather, looking at the conditions. And we have all the data that is shared with the uh, people that are at the site. So this is done in a concerted manner. You can see this is an example of when a report comes in. So it can come through 119 or um, other ways. So we have this system and you can see red blinking lights and we would see uh, the picture that came in and we would look at the location, the GPS position, and we would look at the severity of the fire and different conditions. After that, we would look at the firefighting resources and conditions, whether uh, they are located nearby and how many helicopters are nearby and we would command them to go and others would analyze the neighboring area. For example, because the helicopters would need to be in the air and we would look at the different types of electric uh, transmission lines and if there are any cultural heritages or hospitals or schools that are nearby because they might house many people. So we provide additional information that is useful for these cases. Likewise, weather information is of utmost importance and we work with the Korea Meteorological Agency. So we have three hour uh, 
updates of the weather information that is updated and all of this is recorded in the system so you don't have to make a phone call you can look at the screen and all the agencies would involved would know what is currently going on how many people are now being utilized to suppress the fire you can see our 3d service system and the reason why this is in 3D is because when we see in, in a flat uh, 1D manner or uh, 2D, we do not know the terrain very well. So you can see uh, this 3D response strategy map and you can see the current forest fire in red and you can see the yellow which means that the fire has been suppressed. You can see our firefighters and um, the different helicopters, and they would be located to the needed spots. You can see the helicopter flight path in the red on the right. So in cases we might need this information because we need to know which position the helicopter is concentrating on. Because if the helicopter is con concentrating on particular spots, we would know those areas are uh, the areas that hold the most fire. So we would not need to visit the sites to get access to this type of information. You can see that in a big forest fire, in order for the Korean people to safely evacuate, we would issue orders for people to ev evacuate a certain area. We already have pre-planned evacuation areas, and this is in a database. And based on this information, the evacuation spots are allotted, and the people that have these apps, they get to know what forest fire occurred, where, and where they need to go to evacuate. When you click this button, it will tell you which road or path to take to the uh, evacuation spot and when you use AR augmented reality then it will also let you know which direction you need to take to go to the evacuation area you can see this screen is uh, showing that a fire has occurred and this is uh, sounding out the alarm and when you actually um, go over a certain speed in a car, you might have your navigation that tells you uh, with an alarm that you have exceeded the speed limit. So likewise, we have a red alarm that would actually let us know about the situation. And we would look at a situation, we would look at a report that there is a, there's some smoke coming out from the top of a mountain. And looking at the related information, you can see that uh, other people in that area that are the rangers would give us more pictures or videos of the sites and looking at the situation the HQ can actually make a decision based on the data that comes in without needing to visit the sites you can see this is a stra strategy map of how we extinguish fires and I told you about the different uh, mountainous terrain factors or uh, it also shows us uh, the different latitudes and this is a 3D uh, sh shot of what I just showed you in the 2D map. You can see the helicopter path, all of that is in 3D and I have described to you the different systems used by Korea Forest Service to put out uh, forest fires. Because of climate change around the world, we see so many forest fires. I believe that for these forest fires, we need to share information about firefighting equipment and data. So I believe that we need a network and going for Korea for Forest Service will make pre precise judgments and expedite our response to have safe extinguishment of the fires. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 
for introducing integrated forest fire management system in Korea, including very spectacular video. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Neon Sirimon Konukun uh, from Raja Mangala University of Technology uh, in Thailand. Uh, please welcome her. สวัสดีค่ะ Good afternoon everyone. My name is uh, Neon Silimongkolot Kun. I am an assistant uh, at Rajmongkon University from Thailand. Today I want to present about uh, my uh, smoke wash application. The next slide please. Today I prepare about uh, four. Next slide please. Yes, uh, the first is an overview and the next, the cause of agriculture burning, and the third is preparedness and response, and the foreign non expand and international collaboration. Next slide, please. This picture show uh, about the forest situation around the world, and we can zoom in uh, the some area that we interest. Uh, the fire hotspot in Thailand and neighboring country is very easy to access. This is a NASA website. Next slide, please. And this, I would like to show you the first one is uh, in the past, five hotspots in the past. And the next is uh, in the present. We can see that the pattern of five hotspots on both maps are similar. The next slide, please. And this is the, um, the map of the fire hotspot in uh, GMS country. I mean that uh, cover Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, and Cambodia. Uh, we can see this is a situation uh, every month uh, five years ago. It's the same pattern again and again. This is what happened and what going on. How can we do and how can we know? It's very easy to access for uh, the economic uh, and for the Everyone, but how about the local people can access the hotspot? The next slide, please. This is uh, data from the Geographic and Special Technique Developed Agency. We call it TISTA. This organize is a uh, monitor about the hotspot all of my country. We saw the, um, the two significant. The first is uh, January to, uh, to February, we focus on the Cambodia situation and it's moved. The second one from March to April is in uh, the northern part of Thailand, Myanmar and Laos. Next slide, please. This is the course uh, in my uh, country. I mean that uh, when we go to the ground check, what happened and what going on behind the fire hotspot, we see a lot of uh, they are the agriculture, it's not the forest, but it is uh, agriculture in the forest area. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, as we know that the uh, forest fire is one of the case, the emission, the PM2.5. Uh, it's not only the impact for the global warming, but it's very close up about the health impact also. Uh, the WHO report uh, more than 7 million people uh, have the impact of the, the PM2.5. Next slide, please. I'm found that uh, the one of the firefighters in my country let uh, the area about 800 hectares. So this is the impossible to waiting for the government to solve this problem. How can we do and how can we help them? Next slide, please. Yes, this is the big picture near my village. If we know lately, lately, it's a big damage also. The next slide, please. Uh, now, develop about the uh, hotspot application for monitoring, we call smoke wash. We use uh, for another, we need to show the fire hotspot situation for the public. Next slide, please. This is a fire hotspot monitoring and networking to access the near real time fire distribution, priority manpower, plan a route to fire location, deploy a team to put out the fire. Next slide, please. Yes, next slide, please. Uh, this is the function. 
the first is a map and show the hotspot, five hotspot per day. And the next is a report, the statistic, location, and navigation. It's very important because if we can know about the shortage route to go to the forest fire, we can stop suddenly also. And this is a, a people participation uh, for the can take a photo and um, take the situation for the forest firefighter also. Next slide, please. This show you about how can the, we decide or we set a priority to stop the forest fire. One day we have a lot of uh, fire hotspots occur. For example, this one, when we zoom in and we change the map behind the hotspot, you must know where is it. Uh, it means that the first one is the happen in the open burning. So, and the next is in the forest area. That is a first priority to go together, to work together. Next slide, please. Um, this is a Shirai Command Center, my province. Uh, the government, the provincial set the reward for the district who had a fire hotspot reduced. And they say every district must download the fire hotspot application to monitor together. Next slide, please. And more than that, uh, the district set the reward to the sub-district and the leadership of the village to fire hotspot reduce also. And everyone used this app for monitoring and how to stop the forest fire. This is a transfer for the uh, technology to the local people. Next slide, please. This is we work together about all of my province, 18 district. Next slide, please. Not to over monitor and stop the forest fire, but we work another another side for fire back together and do something that's helped the local people who live in and near the forest to protect the area also. Next slide, please. This is uh, um, the report from the local people and from the leader. What, how about the situation? The forest fire is can stop or not, and they want uh, some of to help her to show on the live application. Next slide, please. Uh, this this picture show you about uh, the late one in the application. It means that the area have a lot of five hotspot, more than ten hotspot in the area. That is a critical area and the first priority to monitor and work together again. Next slide, please. We used this application since uh, three years ago. Uh, the report from the G-Star that Chiang Rai has the minimum burning area because we know rapid time and go to stop the forest fire. So the burn area is reduced also. Next slide, please. Moreover, it's not only the innovation for the monitoring, but we transfer to the school. And this is we call blue school. Blue is mean that uh, is a color of the good air quality. We set up the application to the uh, local people and for the school to learn how can we access and how can we know about the forest fire near the country or uh, near the village. Next slide, please. Yes, and now we try to expand to neighboring country, Laos, Myanmar, and Cambodia also. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, now um, I believe that we are the one in the world, and action from one side of the world can affect people on the other side. So I would like to invite everyone to join, to exchange and see seek collaboration, lead you go warming together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nguyen, for a very instructive presentation. Uh, I think uh, nowadays almost everyone has a cell phone and in terms of dealing with this kind of uh, disasters such as fire uh, and then you know sharing the information is very important and thanks for sharing the one of the best practices. <clears throat> uh, 
Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Yoon Ho Jung uh, from National Institute of Forest Science in the Republic of Korea. And please welcome him. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I've been working for the National Institute of uh, Forest Science for 31 years. And I retired two months in, uh, in two months. Also, I am uh, an advisor uh, of uh, uh, wild, 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 wildfire for Asian Forest Corporation organization, APOCO. And uh, today, I will present, uh, present about the considering the capacity to apply reason to technology and the data to countries. Next slide, please. Uh, contents is a background and uh, advanced uh, countermeasure to wild, uh, wildfire. And third one is uh, support of early detection and first action of uh, firefighting. Next one, uh, last one is uh, applications. Uh, this one is, uh, yeah, application of the system and the tools. Next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Neon is well introduced to the situation, so I will uh, remove this slide. Please, next slide, please. Next slide. Also, uh, the object, Countries is uh, CLMV, so uh, Cambodia, uh, Laos, Vietnam, and Myanmar is uh, my object countries. Next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, looked at the status of focus on our member countries, as you can see on the screen. Uh, in our member uh, countries, uh, Kazakhstan is the country with the highest bond area, approximately 8.8 .8 million hectares over the first decade or, or so. However, the number of fire occurrences is 7,463, being relatively low uh, compared to, to other countries. As seen from the graph, uh, the bond area ratio being higher than the number of fires is also similar in Mongolia. Whereas in Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Myanmar, the Philippines, uh, Thailand and Vietnam, the number of fires is uh, uh, much higher than, than bond, bond area. Next slide, please. It is a Cambodian uh, situation in Siemnip, uh, Cambodia, CCTV is installed in uh, lookout uh, towers are used to detect uh, forest fires and this footage uh, can be uh, seen in wildfire control room. Also, they have uh, the engine uh, supported by upper core for wildfire fighting. However, this system did, uh, doesn't automatically alarm fire, if any. It means uh, officials need to stick uh, to monitors all day long to check for fires. Moreover, detecting fires uh, through reports from public officials or residents is not integrated uh, with the system. Next slide, please. This, this one is a Vietnam uh, system. A lookout tower in Vietnam National University of Forestry is not equipped with CCTV. Uh, so a fire lookouts need to position to the tower to search for fires during the fire seasons. In addition, in Harong City, many suppression tools stacked in storage were uh, really used. And there was no fire, fire control room. Next slide, please. This algorithm shows uh, uh, each stage of wildfire. Wild when a fire occurs in uh, fire field, uh, it needs to be identified if 
it breaks out in mountain or you know, house or factory. This stage is crucial uh, since it determines which agent takes uh, responsibility for suppression. If it occurs in mountain, uh, forest agent takes uh, responsibility. Otherwise, the responsibility goes to fire agent. The responsible, responsible agency suppresses uh, fire and in the uh, progress, process, evacuating residents is given a higher priority. After that, investigations are carried out to provide basic data in order to figure out an ignition point, its course, and even uh, who set the fires. Later on, uh, bond area and the severity are measured and the effort to are made to restore forest in mid of long term. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, fire, fire, uh, wildfire are classified into uh, four cat categories. Ground fire, surface fire, same fire, and ground fire. The fire can be only suppressed if detected before growing into the crown fire. A crown fire causes fly uh, fires and increasing possibility for uh, mega fire. A ground fire usually breaks out in uh, countries with uh, peatland. Since it is uh, invisible, it burns over a long period and uh, suppressing it is challenging as well. Uh, such fires frequently occur in countries like Indonesia. Next slide, please. If a fire, a fire isn't suppressed early, it can become a mega fire. And these pictures so show uh, damage caused by a mega fire. They remind us how crucial early detection and early response is. In particular, a small fire can be dealt with a few uh, suppression resources. However, it is born of uh, large areas. The fire lines become uh, dispersed, making extinguishment even more challenging. Next slide, please. Yeah, very, uh, various methods can be used for early detection. Uh, they include satellite image, CCTV footage captured at a lookout tower or on the top of a mountain, reporting uh, through cell, uh, cellular phone uh, by wildfire looks or residents. In this way, different methods are used to detect uh, fires. On top of that, the integrated control system needs to establish the to compressibly manage early detection. Next slide, please. Uh, it is an uh, uh, integrated fire management system in Korea. Korea has uh, advanced uh, information technology and intensive research on a uh, wildfire has to developing fire prevention system. Now it is practically used in the field. Case in point, uh, uh, fire danger alarming system fire uh, behavior prediction system and forest fire situation control system. In particular, the situation control room helps the authorities to know how many, any uh, fire break out through uh, wildfire lookouts. Next slide, please. In addition, uh, the calculated fire danger index is a uh, practically used in the field. It is transferred uh, through SMS uh, to wildfire lookouts, heads of uh, village, and the responsible police, uh, public officials throughout the nation, so that it is practically used in the field. Next slide, please. This figure shows the key map of wildfire fighting. In daytime, helicopters uh, extinguished the main fire, fire uh, uh, firefighting members of uh, rural government, soldiers in service. 
response to remaining uh, wildfire. In nighttime, there is no helicopter, so is uh, aerial and special fighting firefighting teams extinguish the main fire, and the remaining fire is dealt with the uh, same members as uh, uh, they do in daytime. Next slide, please. Yeah, this one is the um, uh, main point I told you. I was observed that most of ASEAN members' countries not getting uh, ready to assess and or having limited uh, capacities on the application of uh, advanced tools and uh, uh, techniques for holistic fire management. To address uh, such issues and challenges, the AKCF, ASEAN Korea Cooperation Fund, project is to implement it in four of our member countries from next year, from duration five years. The project is entitled Enhance the capacities of CLMB countries on the integrated management of forest fires for conservation of natural resources, uh, enhancement of local livelihood and promotion of MSMEs. Four countries, especially uh, Cambodia, Laos, Laos PDL, uh, Myanmar, and Vietnam are uh, participated in this project. Next slide, please. So uh, the first main object is to develop uh, integrated fire management system by introducing all detection and monitoring system, pro procuring uh, forest suppression equipment and involving local communities in restoration, restoration of forest land disturbed by uh, fire. For this object, the project will build uh, forest fire lookout towers, fire control room, install uh, water tanks, and uh, procure uh, fire engines, and forest fire suppression equipment such as backpack, water pumps, uh, which can be from the next slide. Uh, through this uh, project, it is important to mention that about 10 kilometers of rice and uh, 100 kilograms of fruit will be produced annually. Next slide, please. These are forest fire lookout towers, uh, control room uh, to monitor fires and the machinery and the equipment to suppress uh, forest fires. Next slide, please. So basically, uh, general, general situation is monitored through CCTV cameras in the forest fire control room. When the control room detected smoke, an official in charge informs an official uh, at lookout towers and requests to visit uh, the spot to see if they, uh, there is any fire. If a forest fire detected, officials in the control room will share uh, on-site information with the relate, related organizations. The related organization will receive introduction from the central government and uh, give direction to the general situation center or control room. Then they will send the appropriate number of uh, firefighters and fire engines to the hospitals, uh, given the size and the severity of wildfire. In the meantime, the control room receives real-time reporting uh, from, site, from the site, and if necessary, the step is two or three uh, repeated uh, until the situation is terminated. Next slide, please. Next, next slide, please. Yeah, this, these are uh, alternative options. It is different to be the situation of uh, uh, object countries. As uh, object country is a very different uh, situation on uh, countermeasure of uh, wildfires. Next slide, please. The second objective is strengthen capacity and market linkages in community forestry, micro, small, 
and the medium enterprises. Next slide, please. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay. The third objective is to strengthen institutional and uh, technical capacities for the integrated management of forest fires uh, through training programs and public awareness raising activities. Within the third objective, a number of uh, technical tra uh, training program and modules will be developed. Next slide, please. Yeah, that is the uh, uh, last slide. Uh, what are the things to do target countries? Uh, they, they have to uh, preparing the manual for the uh, uh, wildfire countermeasures and the recruitment of wildfire monitoring agents. Third one is organization of firefighting teams. And the last one is education and training for uh, fire fighting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yoon, for the excellent presentation. It's great to uh, hear that there will be a regional project in Mekong region soon, and we look forward to having a great achievement to the project. Okay, then let's move on to the next session. Uh, it's systematic responses to wildfires. And then, um, so it's a panel discussion, and we have six panelists. We'd like to invite uh, Mr. Gabriel Lavate from UNEP, and Mr. Peter Moore from FAO, and Mr. Petteri uh, Borinen uh, from GCF. And we have uh, two panelists virtually joining, Dr. Nikon Sakun. Tara Dewey um, from Fordia and Dr. Dollars Armit Harris um, from National University of Columbia. Um, so may I uh, invite uh, six panelists and also lastly, uh, the moderating this panel is Dr. Cheney uh, Emily, regional team leader, forest and climate finance from UNEP. Uh, so now allow me to present uh, to Dr. Cheney on the podium. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those uh, joining us from Europe, Africa, and Americas online. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the next session of the Fire, Fire Management Pro Forum. This session, as Kikeng said, will, will focus on systemic responses to the rising threat of wildfires and it is hosted by the UN Environment Program. My name is Emeline Chenet. Uh, I'm UNEP's Forest and Climate Change Team Leader for Asia Pacific. Um, and it's, again, it's really a pleasure to be here with you all. So just a, a few months ago, um, UNEP uh, released a worrying report on the growing threats of wildfires. Um, it said by the end of the century, extreme fires might multiply by 50% with some of our planet's key ecosystems burning more often and climate change made worse by devastating wildfires. And I'm sure you, you've heard a lot about this, this, this you know, through the day already. But this, this uh, event is really to invite us to rethink fire management, to get ready, to get better prepared for more frequent and more intense wildfires. The format is straightforward. We'll be together for an hour. We'll begin by introducing the latest finding of the UNEP uh, spreading like wildfire report that I just mentioned. And then we have an exciting uh, panel of experts of fire specialists from across the world who are joining us in person and remotely. And I'm, I'm happy you can see some of them already uh, on stage and on the screen. But to get us started, I would like to uh, welcome Gabriel Labate, the head of the Climate Mitigation Unit and UNEP, uh, U, sorry, UN Red Global Team Leader at UNEP, to present for us. Gabriel, please. Thanks, Emeline. And uh, welcome, colleagues. 
Welcome, colleagues. Uh, thanks for being here. <laughs> that was exactly the, the video that I wanted to, to show you. And um, with your permission, I'll, uh, I'll give you uh, a short presentation with the main findings of the, of the UNEP report on wildfires. Could we put the presentation uh, on the screen, please? Recording in progress. Thanks very much, um, actually, for showing the, the full extent of the video on the, on the second try. If you could please put the presentation on the screen. To the audience, we will ask you for a bit of patience until the presentation is there. We have it now. Thanks so much for that. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. At the beginning of the, of the year, UNEP completed uh, an effort uh, that took uh, really more than a year since inception until until product, and it was the first um, a global assessment of uh, of wildfires. We presented this uh, in uh, um, in early February, and uh, really we we were surprised by by the traction it got. Um, uh, we we saw that reproduces in the main news outlet, including the Washington Post, uh, the BBC, and others. We, um, we realized that there is a, a growing um, understanding of the, of the problem of, of, of wildfires, and that it is getting traction in the, in the media. This um, 
there was a UNEP uh, effort, but actually it involved a wide range of experts, uh, more than 50 uh, from different institutions worldwide. Next slide, please. Now, um, this, this may not come as a surprise for most of you, but, but it was something that uh, we, we received uh, increasing number of questions uh, coming from, from global media. And the main message is that it is, it is one thing to have a fire here, a fire there, but the extent and, uh, and the intensity of wildfires in the last decade is really transforming this into not just a localized problem, serious one, where it takes place, but it is becoming a global concern. And uh, it, is, it is feeding one, uh, it, is, it is adding uh, uh, strength to what we see as, as positive reinforcements in, uh, uh, in climate change, meaning uh, you know, we, we are undergoing a, a massive uh, uh, process of transformation in our ecosystems. Um, and some of these ecosystems are responding in ways in which you actually exacerbate this, this cycle of increasing warming, increasing impact, increasing warming and increasing impact. Next slide. And uh, the panel that will follow will be talking about some of these things, for example, economic impacts, which are becoming severe. Peter will, will tell us more about that. Health. Um, if some of you are coming from, uh, from Indonesia, for example, where we see serious global fires, uh, you, you've, been, you've been exposed directly to, to the kind of health problems that we will be seeing. Next slide. If you're coming from Australia, <clears throat> there were a number of images about uh, the impact on, on wildlife. And uh, in terms of ecosystems, if we have here colleagues from the Amazonian Basin, maybe you've seen uh, in the last couple of months, which was perhaps one of the most worrying um, research that I have personally seen in the last year, and it was basically the Amazonian Basin is losing um, resilience. And what it was outstanding of this study, it was the way it was quantified. I will not go into that. You can check uh, uh, nature. But basically what you see is that a system in which uh, the planet actually depends. Uh, it is losing its capacity to recover from um, disruptions. And fires, actually, are becoming in the Amazon basin a source of uh, stress and disruption. Uh, the, the Amazon, the northwest of the Amazon, really, the one that in which you see most of the tropical forest that is intact, depends on the water cycle, and the water cycle depends on what is going on in the southeast of the region. It's like a diagonal going from the southeast to the northwest direction. You have troubles in the southeast. You may be able to do protection of ecosystem in the northwest, but 20, 30, 40 years from now, actually, you may see it disappear because of the impact that is uh, that the Southeast is having on the Northwest. Fires are exacerbating these type of problems. Next slide. Um, I am old enough to, you know, remember, uh, you know, when I was 20 years old or 30 years old, even 40 years old, and fires were not 
that much of, a, of an issue, or at least you didn't see that in, in the news. I did my PhD in California. I lived there for, uh, for a good number of years. There were fires. I remember that. But I remember them differently. And I don't remember fires taking place in other parts with the frequency that I can see now. So this, this cycle I was describing earlier is having an impact in which fires are now spreading to parts of the world. You didn't see that before. Next slide. Now, um, when, I was, when I was watching the video, I, um, I was impressed by, by those few seconds in which you would see uh, uh, planes dropping water on, the, on, on fires. Actually, by, by the time that happens, you have probably lost the war. Uh, usually, it's too late. Uh, the, the thing is actually too big. So, a main, a main part of, uh, of for the future, uh, a good part of the solution uh, will be actually in managing the risk of wildfire. Trying, it, 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 it is not a matter of, of bringing wildfires to zero. That's not what you want. But what you want is to have the risk at a manageable level. Next slide. Now, um, the report um, we launched in, uh, in February. Um, you can find that uh, on the web. It includes a number of recommendations. We, uh, together with our colleagues at FAO and other partners, we, we are proposing to uh, to invest in a medium to long term program of uh, of uh, managing wildfires um, and uh, the recommendations are basically um, what you will see in this screen and next first is that um, as I said um, twenty years ago i i didn 't see what I see now first first step is actually to recognize that this is becoming a serious problem. Again, this is not a, a bad fire here, a bad fire over there. This is going to stay with us uh, probably for as long as we live. Um, well, fires are a bit more complex of what we believe. There is a need to understand how they may behave in different situations. and the kind of things that you will want to do in some locations and other things that may be better suited to, to others. One of the things that we are promoting together with our colleagues at, at FAO is international collaboration. There are, uh, there are localized sources of knowledge in, in a good number of countries. This, this knowledge needs to be not only strengthened, but it has to be shared. There is a need to learn from good experiences all over the globe. Next slide, please. Now, um, what you see on the, on the right side of this uh, slide is, is a very interesting part. Of, uh, of this report, and, and it's what we call the five R's. It's uh, review and analysis, risk reduction, readiness, response, recovery. How much money are we spending in each of these things? How much money we should be spending in each of these things? And uh, there, is, there are um, some imbalances. Um, they are not so bad in terms of readiness. They are more um, noticeable in terms of response. They are really surprising in terms of recovery. 
But what I would really like you to, uh, to keep in mind is, is the difference between uh, the investment that uh, we put in these five bars vis-a-vis -vis the damage and loss we suffer once wildfires take place and occur. Main message is that it does make sense, economic sense, to invest in the five R's. Next slide. And this is it of the presentation. This is the final. Thanks very much for your attention. And I give the floor back to Emmeline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. So indeed, yeah, thanks for, for reminding us that we need to be proactive in uh, mitigating and managing wildfires that is essential to secure our climate, our ecosystems, our wildlife, and our health. Now, the question that we really want to address, actually, with this session is how do we approach this in a collaborative, sustainable way, using the best available lessons, learning from each other, working together? So up next, our panel of experts We'll talk about how we must tackle the growing challenge of wildfires through systemic approaches. There will be two rounds of discussions that I'll moderate. Uh, the first in which each speaker will have its, his or her specific question and the second where speakers will um, discuss the point raised in the panel. So I'll just take a brief moment to introduce our panelists. Um, Joining us online from Bogota, where it's, it's midnight, if I'm not mistaken, so we're most grateful for her time, is Dr. Dolores Armenteras Pascual, Professor of Landscape Ecology at the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. Uh, Dolores' work focuses on fire ecology, biodiversity conservation, deforestation, land use changes, and sustainability scenarios. Next, also online, is Dr. Niken Sakuntala Dewi, uh, who is a senior researcher at the National Research and Innovation Agency, and she also coordinates the National, um, sorry, the National Research and Innovation Agency in Indonesia. And uh, Niken also coordinates the national project on improving community fire management and peatland restoration in Indonesia. Also with us is Dr. Peter Moore, who I'm sure does not need any introduction, but I'll try nonetheless. Uh, Dr. Peter Moore is a fire management specialist working at the FAO. His experience includes vegetation fire management, disaster risk reduction in forestry, global fire management cooperation, and fire management best practices. And he has worked with many national governments throughout his career on fire-related projects and strategies. Last but not least uh, with us is Mr. Petteri Vorinen, Senior Forest and Land Use Specialist at the Green Climate Fund. Uh, Petteri has over 20 years of international experience in sustainable forest management and climate change. And his work in developing countries around the world has focused on national policy, forest fires, global and national forest assessment, plantation forest, and global timber trade. So um, I'd like to thank them all for joining us today. Uh, and without further ado, I'll ask my first question to Dolores. So Dolores, Gabriel already mentioned the, the Amazon forest, but this is really, um, you know, you are one of the world's experts on, on this. So um, the Amazon forest is becoming more vulnerable to fires and drought, as we know, and has reached its highest deforestation rate in over a decade last year, in 2021. What can you tell us about the vicious circle of recurrent fires and loss of resist resilience affecting the Amazon forest? And, and more, more importantly, how can the balance be restored? Well, uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, no, first of all, greetings to all, wherever you are in the world. And thank you, the organizer, for inviting me to talk about a region that, as you all are well um, aware, hosts 50% of the world's tropical forest. So beyond its known biological and cultural diversity, these forests are also essential part of the global hydrological cycle, as Gabriel has mentioned, with up to 15, 20% of the water circulating through them. 
um, as per the recent report by the scientific panel of the Amazon, which I'm part of as well. And the rich ecology of the Amazon forest is tied to their moisture. So that's the essential point here or today what we, we need to talk or what you're asking me. Because as such, these forests are highly vulnerable to climate change. So just because of that, because whatever they are, there is a result of the moisture and the conditions uh, where they uh, are hosted. And moisture stress, water stress, when a drought happens, when climate change uh, pushes for longer, dry season, uh, more extreme events with extreme droughts, uh, severe, severe droughts, um, this increases, uh, uh, for example, tree mortality in the Amazon in a very susceptible, vulnerable forest um, to this kind of a stress. On the other hand, we have land use change, right? And it's also of great concern and fire is everywhere, but in the Amazon is often what has been used as a tool for land management. When it does get out of control, fire drives tremendous levels of deforestation, but also degrades standing forests and amplifies what um, the mortality and all the degradation effects related with drought. But I want to bring back the point that fire has been used in the Amazon for centuries by local communities and traditional communities, and we didn't have wildfires before, or not, we didn't have mega fires and this big big effect. So this is really important and it's part of what is in the report. But then there's another feedback, right? If forests disappear, forests are degraded, evapotranspiration is reduced, and as such the moisture that circulates and is transported into the atmosphere um, ends up reducing rainfall. Uh, locally, regionally and globally uh, it has this effect. So Yes, climate change is made worse by wildfires, emissions, carbon emissions, and globally, but we also uh, have fires that are enhanced um, droughts, or fires that enhance droughts, but also um, we have drought enhanced fires that perhaps do not occur equally over the entire Amazon because the Amazon is an entire region um, that spans nine countries. And for instance, I work at the northwestern part uh, of the Amazon, which is the wettest. Um, but these uh, drought-enhanced fires are clearly widespread and are increasing the vulnerability of these forests, right? So other factors act also synergistically, the fragmentation, the edge effects that make that um, uh, uh, the forest edges are more exposed to desiccation and then are more vulnerable to, to a fire occurrence and then there's a higher risk of uh, degradation. And as a result, Amazon forests are right losing uh, resilience. So yes, the, there is a very worrying situation. And as Gabrielle introduced, um, there's a, a, a big concern and a lot of um, need for action in the region. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doros. And thank you also for reminding us that not all fires are unwanted. It's, it's about finding a balance. So thank you so much. Now I'll move to, to Niken, uh, if I may. Um, Indonesia has experienced increasing fire risk and incidents since the 80s, um, and the country has a long history of responding to extreme and long-lasting peat fires. So how can fire management practices be complemented by actions in other sectors, such as agriculture, plantations, economic development, and so on? Thank you, Emily. Um, good day, folks. It's good to be part of this important forum within the World Forestry Congress virtually. And I'm happy uh, that I can learn a lot from this session about the experience of various countries in dealing with the forest fire. Yeah, Indonesia has uh, enough of a lot of experience uh, in forest fire. And we realize that it is very difficult to extinguish the fire, especially if the fire occurs on pitland. Often the solution depends on the rain. And the cost uh, of uh, extinguishing the fire is very, very expensive. And the record that I have in 2019, we spent around 250 million US dollars for that. So uh, through the years of experience, we found that forest and peatland fire are complex issues apparently. Uh, they involve social, economic, environmental, technical, 
even the policy aspect. And we realize here that more than 99% of fire sources are influenced by human activities uh, or negligence and are generally closely related, related to socioeconomic aspect. Um, now, uh, we do our best uh, to emphasize on fire prevention rather than uh, fire uh, suppression. Even the president gave an instruction to reach a permanent solution and the effort to prevent forest and land fire. And there are some um, uh, activities that we do here uh, from policy aspect, uh, technical aspect, social institutional aspect, uh, economic aspect, from the national into the uh, local level. From the policy aspect, uh, there's an establishment of an agency for peatland restoration with a target to restore 1.2 million hectares of peat ecosystem in seven uh, provinces. Uh, there's also prohibition of burning during land preparation, especially on peatlands. But for indigenous people who still practice local wisdom in farming on mineral land, it's because this is uh, their culture, uh, they are still allowed to burn an area of two hectares per household. And there's also policy uh, on pit with a depth of more than three meters is allocated as a protected area and a shallow pit of less than two meters in depth as a cultivation area. There's also policy on the groundwater level that is uh, not more than 40 centimeters below the pit service. From the technical aspect, there's a construction of canal blocking and drilling well, drilled well, especially in the pit land, to restore the pit soil moisture. Um, actually, this, is an effort, uh, this effort is to overcome the development activities that have already been carried out in Indonesia uh, in the past, as well as there has to be a securing water sources. And in the local community, there's also, uh, I mean, in social institu institutional aspect, there's a formation of the fire care community group at the village level. We have also Ministry of Environment and Forestry, Land and Forest Fire Control Bridge. Um, and then there's also massive socialization and education on pit protection and management uh, to stakeholders. And then in the economic aspect, uh, the government introduced the environmentally friendly uh, agriculture. It's a land preparation without burning. We also promote paludi culture or the use of pit, uh, pit land without drainage. Uh, there's also village uh, that care about uh, fire. Um, this is about community who voluntarily care about forest and land fire control. They have been trained or provided with supplies and are empowered uh, to assist forest and land fire control activities. There's also pit care village with the three R, like rewetting uh, vegetation and uh, economic revitalization program mm -hmm. uh, in that uh, area. And we have also uh, in the regency level, there's a communication and coordination is very important from the national level to the site level. Uh, in the village level, there's also the fire care community uh, carries out uh, fire safety or prevention, they do patrols. Um, uh, they also record and monitors the movement of the outsider entering the village. Um, there's also training for fire care communities and the village uh, allocate budget uh, for uh, fire prevention throughout the year. And we have also like a fire danger rating system for forest and peatland fires. And now we are working. 
May I ask you to please um, uh, finish your answer in the next minute? So we'll, we'll get back to you in a bit later. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, another thing also we do the pit fire danger rating system. Basically, it's, we, we realize that it's not a simple issue to uh, handle the pit fire. A lot of indicators that we have to take into consideration, not just a rainfall or uh, like uh, drought indicators, but also land cover, soil particle, um, economic poverty risk, those issues are uh, should be put into consideration. Yeah, that's Thank basically you. what uh, we do in Indonesia. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. Thank you for, thank you, and thank you for highlighting indeed the, the multifaceted nature of this challenge. And but it's really great to hear about this shift from suppression to prevention uh, of fire in Indonesia. Um, moving on to Peter. Um, Peter, wildfires have a huge impact on local, national, and global economies. I think actually Nikan just, just hinted at that in her in her response, and and the extent um, the the, Im the economic impact of fires extends for years after the the, the fire itself has sus subsided, essentially. So, what is the estimated economic cost of fires? And how does it compare with current investment in fire prevention and management? Um, thank you very much, Emmeline. And, and as with Nikon and Dolores, I'm very happy to be part of this panel. I'm very, uh, uh, very good to be here. I'm, I'm really enthusiastic about answering a question about money when I'm sitting next to someone from the Green Climate Fund. Um, and There's I'd no like coincidence. To, no, probably not. And I think there's three, there's three main points that we need, we need to think of. And I'll illustrate the first of them by pointing out that in 2021, you would have heard that Chile had a very bad couple of fire seasons. And they committed $180 million to their suppression activities uh, for that next year. And that's a big number. Um, the USA federal expenses are about $1.9 billion per annum. And they're up 170% in a decade. So the trend is not a good one um, at all. And in Canada, they're increasing about 100 and 120 million Canadian dollars uh, per decade over the last three decades. So in the same way, they're, they're, and these are fire suppression, fire readiness, uh, expenses are all going up uh, all the time. So the first point is that this is an expensive business. The, the suppression side of things is a really expensive business. And as Emily mentioned, um, the idea of shifting some of that expenditure in another direction for a better return is a really good idea. There is a, a hitch to being able to make the case for that very strongly. And, and that is that damage and loss includes a very wide range of things. There's obviously people that are injured or die, lose their lives in fires and that's tragic and awful. Uh, there's infrastructure that gets burnt, and we saw some, some photographs in the video, some, some tracks in that, and I'm sure you've all seen them on the television. There's ecological biodiversity and, and water catchment quality impacts. Nikan mentioned, uh, mentioned water, as did um, Dolores. There's disruption and dislocation. Uh, communities, towns, populations that have to move either because they don't have anywhere to live anymore or because they're, they're, what they depend on for their livelihood has moved. Uh, they have to move to, to pursue that. So there's a lot of impacts. So you can imagine assessing the damage is quite a big thing. In the video it was mentioned, and Gabrielle mentioned it as well, was the health impacts. Now these health impacts, we have in the last two years, really good example. We've all become very sensitive about our lungs. We're wearing masks around because we don't want to transmit diseases or, or to get them. And smoke comes into our lungs. So we've got an increased sensitivity of being aware that lungs are important things. And now we're realizing that a lot of us are exposed um, at different times, sometimes for extended periods. So there's a long-term health impact involved in that. As well as that, there's the mental health impacts. Now in Australia, where I come from, 2019, 2020, it was an extended period. That fire season had significant large fires that started in the start of August and finished at the end of February in the following year. So it was a consistent rolling process. And a lot of communities were 
very much dislocated, they were uh, disenfranchised, isolated, and they're still recovering from those things. In some parts of California, fires that burnt communities four years ago, there are still people who are not back in their homes. So for four years, you have a family that is not at home, maybe not going to the same school, maybe not having the same job. Those mental stresses are huge, they're extraordinary. The point is that if you look at all of those things, it's very hard to get a figure on that. So we know there's a lot of expenditure on fires, and we know that there's a lot of damage and loss that's caused, but it's hard to get a figure on it. It isn't a very well studied thing. You would think it would be, and I know that uh, over the past three years when I was with FAO working with the World Bank on a report that came out two years ago, and then with UNEP on this report earlier this year, looking as hard as we could for figures, for numbers, for things that explained what appears to be a self-evident thing, which is we spend a lot of money in one direction and we're concerned about it. We have a huge amount of damage and loss, but we really don't know how much it is. So therefore, what should we be doing? We were lucky to come across, or not lucky, but there was a study done for the year of 2015 for the United States. And this is the only study I've ever seen, and I've been doing this stuff for 40 years. It's the only study I've seen that looks at the whole picture for one country, but only for one year. What was interesting was that the total damage bill was $7.4 billion in one year. And it didn't include all of the things I just mentioned as potential damages. There's nothing in there about mental health or any of, any of those things, or human health. At that same, in that same year, 4.4 billion of that seven of, was spent on suppression. So there's 7.4 billion spent on the whole package of the costs for fires, and 4.4 spent on the suppression side of things. So there's 60% of the expenditure. And this was the graph that Gabrielle put up is from, is from that paper, from using the data from that paper. You would have recalled from the graph two things. One is that, as I just mentioned, the balance of expenditure in the 7.4 billion is heavily in suppression, 60% related to suppression. So that's something that needs to change. But the second key point is that that 7.4 billion is very, very small compared to the total damage and the losses. If you remember the column, it was, there was 7.4 billion at the bottom and it's nearly $100 billion of total damage and loss. So unfortunately, we don't have a ready-made metric around investing more in risk reduction gives us a benefit on a certain kind. So there's two things we have to do. The first is we have to look, and this is a collaborative effort, as Emmeline said, a collaborative effort to look at, well, how can we measure these things? How can we routinely do them? In, even in a year when it's quiet and there aren't many fires, what data can we collect that helps to add in to the data set so that we can look at trends and we can cover an extended, if not the full set of information that we need. So that's the first, uh, the first step we need to do. The second is that we do need to mobilise the sort of consistent and persistent investment so that we can undertake some of those things. There are reasons these figures aren't readily available. Firefighting agencies are busy fighting fires and they account for their own expenditure, the money that comes into them, the money they have to spend. Communities and things are being impacted, but they're too busy recovering and working out what to do with their children and with their job and get some money, uh, et cetera. So that's where we need to work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. I think that's, that's very clear. Um, we do need to make greater effort to basically measure the cost of fires, including the human impact, and also mobilize stable, consistent investment for fire management. Um, I'll now move to Gabrielle again um, to ask him, so the increased incidence of wildfires is profoundly disrupting the, the stability of forest ecosystems, as, as we, we have heard, and essentially it constitutes a serious threat to the permanence of emission reductions. So how can we better support countries in reaching the Glasgow mitigation goals in light of the growing threat of wildfires? Like about, um, 
I think a month ago, there was the latest report from the IPCC working group on the, on the current status of uh, um, where we are and where we should be. And what was really striking is that um, uh, if you go and see all the IPCC models, that those that are uh, charting a pathway to 2050 and uh, staying within within 1.5 degree change, uh, you will notice that uh, all of them depend on the Afolu sector being uh, uh, net zero by 2030 in eight years and actually becoming strongly negative after that. If you don't have that, then the amount of technological carbon capture and storage you got to do by 2050, it rapidly becomes something in the domain of science fiction. I mean, like two times, three times the amount of emission reductions of the European Union. There is nothing now uh, that could produce that level of uh, of carbon capture. So, um, it means that land use change as a, as a sector, um, the, the, the dynamic, the pathway, uh, the trajectory has to change uh, very, very quickly. And uh, forests are, uh, wildfires are actually not helping. It's, uh, it's, it's another brick, brick on the wall, and it's, uh, and it's a heavy one. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm also happy to be uh, alongside somebody from the Green Climate Fund <laughs> in a wildfire discussion because of the implications that we, we have for, for climate. Um, we, uh, in the UNEP report and together with our colleagues of FAO, we, um, we are trying to chart a pathway for the next 10 years, uh, trying to, to uh, put in place at scale uh, the five R's that I presented in the, in the slides. Um, I would say that uh, perhaps step number one, as I was mentioning, is the recognition of the problem. This is a problem uh, uh, and it will continue to be a problem and the problem will be bigger. The second is uh, the, the understanding of uh, how this problem um, behaves and how it can be tackled. I would say the third is to also learn from what is going on at this uh, same time. We have seen some very, very interesting presentations before this session uh, on practical experiences happening on the ground. Um, learn from what is uh, being done at the moment, see what can be improved and see how you can scale. Thank you, thank you, Gabriel. I feel I really need to ask Petri a question now. There's a, very, a lot of people who are keen to hear from him. So, um, Petri, wildfires and climate change are interconnected phenomena. I think we, we all know this. Uh, they are reinforcing each other. So, wh wh what is the scope? What scope do you see for climate finance, either from public sources like the GTF, but also private sources? What's the scope for climate finance to support the prevention and management of wildfires? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much all for inviting me first to do this event. It's very nice to be around fire guys since <laughs> a few years. And about financing. Yes. I start with the first important point. Green Climate Fund is supporting fire management activities. Um, and I'm really keen on receiving proposals for project ideas from you. 
here in the room and also people online. So, and actually we are working on fire management already. So many of our projects in the forest and land use sector, they have components and activities related to fire management. There is early detection, uh, development and implementation of fire management plans, establishing community fire crews, uh, prevention activities on protected areas, awareness raising campaigns. So we are working on it. We don't have fire management projects per se, but in many projects we have components on them. Of course, my personal idea is to lift the profile of the fire management. That's why I have been insisting to getting into this forum. And then talking about public finance. Yes, I think it's there. But unfortunately, we fire and forestry guys, we are not very good at talking to the other sectors. And it's a bit unfortunate. We have been talking with Peter about this uh, for 20 years now, that we need this cost information. If you want to have money, you need to talk money. People, Ministry of Finance, they need to know the figures. When we go to the Ministry of Health, we need to know how many people are impacted by the fires. Uh, how many discarriages in the year there are because of the toxic smokes pregnant women are inhaling. We need to have those figures down. And then with those figures, when we go to our partners in different ministries, I'm sure we will get support for them. They are not stupid. They very quickly do the calculations. And then talk about private finance. That might be a bit trickier, but uh, these days, there's a boom in the carbon markets. There are carbon projects popping up everywhere around the world. And for many of those at the field level, the fire is one of the big risks for those investments, for those projects. So definitely the fire community should tap in, get in touch with these investors, with these projects. There will be for sure opportunities for collaboration. And also then mention now the COP26 pledges. There was pledges to stop deforestation. There's the pledges to support the indigenous people and local people. These have a direct contact to what we do at the fire sector, forestry fire management, um, direct link. There will be more pressure on countries to work on protecting forest, work with the local communities, and we are working on those all the time. So it's another making the dots, linking the dots. And like I said in the beginning, we are working on this. I want to have project proposals. So start drafting project proposals for me. And we have also facilities to support getting these studies done, getting the figures on the table, assessments, studies. And we provide funding also for you to write the project proposals and further develop the funding proposals. So please approach us. Um, okay, I'll leave, leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Petri. Uh, indeed, I agree, like the, the fire community really has a, a clear economic case to leverage finance from a range of sources, GCF being one of them, but uh, private, uh, also private sources and, and uh, domestic uh, public uh, budget. So, um, I, I, you know, we, we, we're running a little bit out of time, but I still want to go through um, a second round to give all of you, all of our panelists, an opportunity to reflect on what they've heard. Um, uh, if, if, if you've been, you know, uh, it could be something you've heard this morning or uh, in this panel. Uh, but, you know, the idea is uh, what, what opportunities do you see for greater collaboration on systemic responses? Uh, to the to wildfires uh, across sectors, across communities, across countries. Dolores, should we start with you? Yes, please. <laughs> no, um, I think it's. Um, I want to bring a point, a very um, important point. First of all, that the, the the rapid assessment report is the first one that internationally, uh, not the fire community, people that are worried about the sustainability of our landscapes, agreed and align on a on a goal of switching to a more integrated fire management way of handling things to reduce wildfires 
even considering all the regional uh, differences that are all over the world. I worry sometimes whether some interest was a reason because of the Australia, Mediterranean and California fires. And I have the experience in the Amazon that only when Sao Paulo got clouded by the smoke in 2019 was everybody more or less. So I do get worried about that because uh, there are certain uh, top-down approaches, but also we have to meet with bottom-up uh, ones. And at least in the Amazon, I've been standing uh, the northwestern part of the Amazon for over 15 years. 17 years, 20 years, and there have been fires for a long time, and we didn't manage to get into the agenda until very recently. And again, sometimes we have to acknowledge the regional differences, acknowledge the difference uh, um, in capacities. I worried about if, like Peter was saying, you know, uh, the information we have on wealthier countries is not uh, the same level of information that we are able to have in middle and lower income countries. And then we have to have an honest discussion about what's the challenge or what are the challenge, challenges of establishing an equilibrium in countries like mine. I'm based in Colombia with such a dynamic environment, with lots of conflicts, with lots of um, solutions, socioeconomic solutions and inequalities to solve within the country and across countries and globally. So I think this is something that we need to acknowledge. We need to acknowledge local knowledge, existing processes like uh, Dr. Nikon was mentioning, restructure investment um, and, and deal with governments, but again, not from a top-down approach, but finding a, a common ground in that um, sense. So I just wanted to bring always the point of inclusion, diversity, representativeness of the Global South in these discussions, because we are often um, left over in many of the processes. So sorry to bring this point now. I know we're closing, but I thought it was very important because the global, uh, the rapid report assessment is a common framework, but we have to acknowledge the differences that uh, are very important in the countries. And we need to have the, the honest dialogue about what is more um, important, the fire or the forestation, for instance, in, in, in the Amazon. What's the cause of all this and how are we not going to solve it if we don't go down to the bottom of the real cause, which it mm -hmm. has to do with inequality and social problems. So thank you. So that's the point I wanted to bring. Thank you. Yeah. And an important one. Thank you so much. Um, Niken, would you like to add something briefly? Just just one minute, yeah, uh, one, one point. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I just realized that forest and peatland fire are a very complex problem and efforts to overcome, uh, overcome it must be seen as the lines, uh, at the landscape scale and as part of the national development planning and uh, based on the root of the problems and should be carried out completely, uh, uh, comprehensively involving various uh, stakeholders. And I could see that a lot of knowledge uh, are there uh, from the various sessions so knowledge management is very important and exchange expert probably one of the good things that we could do uh, to manage uh, the fire. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Yeah, very, very important as well. There, there is knowledge to be shared and, and, and spread because we're not, there is years of experience actually in, in this field. Um, Peter, would you like to? Yes, just, just quickly. Yeah. In fact, I'd like to pick up on exactly the same points because as, as the Dolores said, this is people, of course, 90% of fires, 90% of ignitions, and 90% of fires never get to the size that you need significant firefighting resources. That means that it's all happening at the community level. And that means that if you really want to work on this issue, you need to be at the community level. Mm -hmm. And that consultation needs to be wide open. And it needs to be wide open for the, all the reasons that, that Dolores mentioned and that Nick and talked about, but it also needs to be wide open so that we can bring in even, say, all of the things that have been noted this morning. There are some really good examples of people doing really good things, mm -hmm. Timor-Leste, here in Korea, uh, in other countries, that we just don't know about. So we need to have some level of activities and, and those things, but they need to be persistent and consistent. Because as Dolores says, and I lived with that phenomena, that the government is really interested when there's big fires and they're in the news, and then three weeks later when it's rained, they're not interested anymore. And so you can't you can't build a fund you, you can't get a funding structure around that. 
and you can't get persistence. So that inclusion yeah. and cohesion, but also consistent engagement yeah. would be fantastic. Thank you, Peter. Petri? I'll finish with Gabriel, so I'll give you a chance oh, now. You surprised me. <laughs> uh, yes, collaboration and cooperation, yes. And also with that, we can help you. We are working with uh, more than 120 we call them accredited entities around the world. So we can also help you find partners and co-financiers for your projects. So just please send me your one-pager idea. Don't go through the official DCF process, it's long. If you have an idea, send me an email, one-pager, and we start talking about it before you go any further. That's all from my I part. feel that we need a slide with your email address now, but uh, maybe we oh, can quickly should. put that. <laughs> this is being recorded, isn't it? <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, you're right, Peter. We, we will share Petri's <laughs> full contact details. Um, but uh, I want, you know, we, we are already, I think, I feel going over time. So please, Gabrielle, um, the last words with you. One of the problems of speaking last when you share a panel with smart people is that most probably they will say most of the things you wanted to say. <laughs> so I, I will just pass due recognition to, to what I've heard. To Dolores is, yeah, recognition and understanding. I was in that part of the world when Sao Paulo was clouded in smoke. It was, I had never seen that. I, I've been in that city a few times. I, I couldn't believe that was the city I, 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 I used to go often. So, uh, but, but it cannot be the case that you get recognitions when you see these things. It's, uh, again, it is, when you see these things in the news, it's, it's already too late, probably. Um, from Peter, uh, this, is, uh, this is a costly business. Uh, uh, it, it does make a very strong economic case to, to start addressing these things uh, before they, they happen. Um, from Niken, um, there are really good experiences that are available. Some of these things work very well for some situations, may need adaptation uh, for application somewhere else. But uh, um, first things first, uh, we we got to learn. Uh, we got to see what is what is already being uh, being done and applied. Um, from Petri, I think that I I I highlight this uh, willingness to help. Uh, I don't really. I've been dealing with the GCF for quite some time. This is the first time that I see an official saying, "Send me proposals." You know, like. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, if uh, people will take you at your word. <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually, my contribution to, to, f to finish this is, uh, I think it is a call to action. Um, that is what the UNAR report tried to, tried to generate. It's uh, the understanding that this is a problem. Um, it is... It is starting, it will get worse. Um, and uh, we, gotta, we gotta do something about it. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a call you. to action. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. And thank you once again to all our panelists online and here with us in Seoul. Um, indeed, uh, now more than ever, we need to work together to tackle this challenge. Um, I wanna thank the audience as well. Thank you so much for staying uh, tuned here in Korea and online. If you have any questions or comments, uh, or if you want Petri's email address, you can um, to write to uh, communications at unred.org, uh, it's un-red.org, uh, uh, or you can come and see me after the session. Uh, but we'd really like to hear from you. Um, I also wanna thank the FAO team for hosting this forum. Uh, and, and, and inviting us to, to uh, host this session. Um, so this is the end of this session, but the fire management forum is, is, still, is still going. Uh, after the coffee break, there will be a, a round table discussion uh, on exactly the way forward with regards to fire management. 
So stay tuned and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will start our session shortly. É, enfim, eu acho que essa questão de nivelamento de conceitos também e Catherine, a gente está à disposição. Fantástico. Acho que vai começar. Depois falarmos se quisermos, marcamos uma conversa, Lara e Catherine. Sim, Catherine. sim, tira a ficha. Sim. Então vá, terá. Olá, Helena. Now we we'll proceed to the next session, Way Forward. And we have five experts for this session, and they are all joining virtually. Uh, Mr. Gabriel Zacharias and Ms. Lala Eastdale from National Center for the Prevention and Combat of Forest Fire, and Ms. Elena Hernandez Paredes, Head of Service, Forest Fire Protection Department. Ministry for Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenges in Spain, and Dr. Tiago Oliveria, Chairman, Board of Directors from Agency for Integrated Management of Rural Fire in Portugal, and lastly, Dr. Catherine Istup, Assistant Professor of Pure Life Innovative Training Network, Wegenigen Fire Center. In, in Netherlands. We will hear from the speakers in the order in which they were introduced, and the speakers will each speak for about five minutes. So uh, can we check whether all the five speakers with us? Hello. 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 Tiago Oliveira, speaking from Lisbon. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good, good afternoon in here. <laughs> yes. Good morning from Brazil. from Brazil and good afternoon to South Korea. Here it's Lara from Brazil. And good morning um, from the Netherlands and good afternoon. This is Catalina Stoll from, from the Netherlands speaking. Hello to everyone. This is Elena Hernandez from Spain. I'm also here ready to participate. Great. Um, then, uh, may I ask Mr. Gabriel Zacharias uh, for your intervention for five minutes? Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thanks for the organizing committee for inviting us to share the experience of Camp Grand Statement. To talk about Camp Grand Statement, first, it's important to understand where it came from. It was launched at the end of the 7th International Wildland Fire Conference. The International Wildland Fire Conference aims to facilitate the sharing of knowledge and expertise in wildland fire policies, research, management, and capacity building in an international forum. Providing an international forum that serves as an interface between fundamental science, policymakers, and a community of practitioners, firefighters, researchers, civil society, and others to share knowledge and expertise. The overall goal of the conference is to support the development of policies, the improvement of governance to reduce negative impacts of landscape fires on the environment and humanity, and to advance the knowledge and the application of the ecologically and environmentally benign role of natural fire in the fire-dependent ecosystems and sustainable application of fire in land use and fire land use systems. Next slide, please. The conference was launched in 1989 and took place for the first time in Boston, United States, and eight years later in Vancouver, Canada. Since then, the conference has been held every four years visiting every continent, Oceania. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, Europe, Africa, Asia, and South America. As you can see, one of the recurring themes 
is the role of human beings and their relationship with fire. For supporting the host nations and providing expert advice based on the past experience and the emerging issues, there is the International Liaison Committee. This committee is designed to provide the conference host country with the best management practices. Next slide, please. The seventh conference in Brazil evaluated the three decades of international cooperation facilitated by these conferences. They aim to create a global science policy practitioners interface, the achievements and the gaps in fire management globally. Next slide, please. The conference was attended by more than 1,000 government officials, scientists, practitioners, the private sector and civil society from 41 countries and by United Nations agents and the other international and regional organizations. The seventh conference had three official languages and this could be a cultural barrier as it could be a cultural barrier for Latin America and more specifically for Brazilian people. And what we saw at the seventh conference was the presence of firefighters, indigenous and traditional people who cannot participate in this kind of event abroad or in a language other than their native one. The opportunity to host this conference in Latin America was unique for us. And these people were able to participate in the construction of Camp Grand Statement that Larry's tale will speak to us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gabriel Jacarias. Then can we hear from Ms. Lala Istail uh, for any addition or intervention? Yes, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. And uh, so uh, during this uh, series of conferences, uh, we developed this document, the statement, and uh, which is a document with uh, the view of the participants about uh, fire issues with uh, advices and the uh, reflections to guide the nations to deal with fire in the next four years until the next conference when a new statement will be launched. Uh, the first draft of the stat statement is developed by a core group and after that the draft is uh, shared with all participants in the conference and uh, if they have any comment or suggestion they can send it to the core group. And uh, eventually we have the final version of the, sta the statement, which is uh, spread between the participants and to the international fire community. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the Campo Grande statement, uh, the participants of the conference pointed out that in many uh, regions of the world, wildfires are a growing threat to communities and to natural, cultural, rural, urban and industrial landscapes. Because of that, there are consequences at social, economic and ecological levels. This is affecting human health and security and resulting in the loss of public and private assets. And the one important point uh, the participants of the conference uh, uh, highlighted is that the current risky governance and institutional arrangements are inadequate to cope with this growing trend. And it's necessary a cross-sectoral approach. Next, please. In addition, uh, the participants agreed that the paradigm of addressing the problem through individual and disconnected services and actions in fire uh, prevention and suppression should be reframed. So, an unified and integral planning must ensure and strengthen societal, environmental and economic resilience to landscape fires by addressing some important issues, uh, which are risk governance and ownership, dialogue of knowledge, including traditional and indigenous knowledge, gender diversity and inclusion, socioeconomic innovation in rural landscapes, favoring nature-based options, solutions, strengthening local action, and the creation of resilient ecosystems and communities. And having these six intents in mind, Brazil and the South America fire community have been working 
on addressing the these guide points of Campo Grande statement. Uh, next, please. And uh, related to risk governance and ownership, here in Brazil, we developed a national policy on integrated fire management, which supports the decision-making process in a cross-sectoral approach. In the same way, other countries are developing the legal framework for integrated fire management, as is the case in South America of Ecuador. Next, please. And uh, addressing the dialogue of knowledge and uh, strengthening local action. In Brazil, we are working with the local communities, learning from them the traditional and the indigenous and local knowledge on fire use and the whole of this fire inside their territories. And this action is improving our institutional strategies and the outcomes. Next, please. Uh, still addressing dialogue of knowledge, we launched a public call for scientific research so we could share with the institutions of research what we need to know about fire in our ecosystems to support our process of decision making. And again, other countries are working very close to scientific community to answer field questions, as is the case again of Ecuador in a trilateral project uh, between Germany, Brazil, Costa Rica, and uh, Ecuador. Next, please. Uh, related to gender, we are starting to work with indigenous women to understand their knowledge on fire management. And uh, in addition, we are discussing and implementing different standards in the recruitment process for firefighters, what bring us to a more equal environment on integrated fire uh, management in the country. Next, please. And uh, focusing on socioeconomic innovation in rural landscapes, we have been promoting low-cost sustainable alternative techniques to fire use in rural management, which are solutions based on nature. So with that, we can contribute to create resilient communities and also improve their quality of life. Also, this strategy has been adopted by other countries in, in the region, as is the case of Bolivia and uh, Ecuador, through uh, uh, international cooperation projects. Next, please. And uh, finally, we are strengthening local actions through regional cooperation among the countries. Through intercultural share of knowledge, we are improving the regional capacity and the local capacity to deal with fire. And the two important examples in, in the region uh, of that uh, are the Memorandum of Understanding on Integrated Fire Management under the auspices of ACTU, the Amazon Cooperation Treaty, and a protocol for forest fire management in the Amazon under the auspices of the Leticia Park. So these are some of the local and the regional achievements since the last International Wildland Fire Conference. And the next, please. To finish my presentation, I will bring the final thoughts of the Campo Grande statement. The participants of the conference agreed that decision-making must be evidence-based and supported by monitoring, evaluation, adaptation systems and the implementation should, should be coherent, cohesive, and coordinated. It's uh, emphasized that the uh, integrated cross-sectoral approach supports uh, international agreements, sustainable development goals, the goals of the Paris Agreement, and the Sendai framework. The participants of the conference highlight that an appropriate United Nations instrument would further strengthen this approach. And this brings us to my le uh, last slide uh, and uh, to our expectations for the next conference in Portugal. Next, please. Where we will discuss principles for integrated landscapes fire management uh, governance. So this is what we have to share with you. Thank you for your attention. And uh, thank you. And we are available for any doubts. Uh, I don't know if we have time now. If we, we don't, 
uh, we are available at time uh, through our emails. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gabriel and Lara. Yeah, we want to hear more about it, but due to the time limitation, we need to move on to the next speaker. Thank you again. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Elena Hernandez Paredes. Uh, Elena, are you with us? Yes, yes, hello. I'm, I'm here and happy to, to join this uh, side event again. Uh, on my side, I will reflect on, on the regional Mediterranean statement that was uh, presented at the last wildfire conference. And, and in this regard, let me tell you that at regional level in the Mediterranean uh, region, uh, things are working at high performance, let's say. Initiatives and actions have grown exponentially. This is good for the region since debates are taking place at different levels and both population and politicians seem to be more aware of the welfare situation. But besides this, there's still a long way to go. Unfortunately, our region has experienced very sad episodes with a large number of casualties. But we should not only highlight this catastrophic event, which being the worst in terms of people affected, represent a small percentage of the total number of wildfires in the region. Let's not forget that because sometimes the public attention and the politicians' attention is on this, on this uh, reduced number of wildfires with very, very uh, hard consequences, but it's not everything, it's just a part. There are many other wildfires with devastating consequences, also in terms of loss of the vegetation cover, affecting directly its soil's protection role, and these consequences are translated into the certification processes, mainly in southern countries within the region, but, uh, but also into processes, into processes such as landslides, which suppose an additional threat to infrastructures and population. These consequences of losing the vegetation cover are being intensified and accelerated by climate change that is that it's for real. Nevertheless, under this scenario, we also see light. And we see that thanks to science, research, new technologies, systematic gathering and analysis of data, and accumulate experience, we are being aware and we're shifting towards a more proactive approach at all levels, prevention, suppression, and recovery, which is what the current um, scenario of global change is demanding us. And here I would like to highlight again, proactive approach. I think this is key and we have to keep it in our minds. The Mediterranean regional statement is the result of a wide consultative process between Mediterranean countries, including European Union countries, North Africa and Middle East countries too. It is a structure in five priority lines of action 28 actions in total and 10 key factors. And because we don't have much time, I just would like to highlight a few of these key factors. One, which is the base one, a fire is a management tool. It has historically been present and we cannot deny its role in wildfire management. And I'm stressing this because um, let's be careful Let's be careful, we're noticing at European level and even at national level that some regulations that are being developed uh, regarding climate change and greenhouse gases emissions are, um, are looking at fire just as a as, um, provider of greenhouse emissions. So um, there is a great development in this regard, but fire cannot be seen just a source of greenhouse emissions. We cannot be that uh, short-sighted, let me say. Uh, and here I want to link with prescribed burns and the need of some natural fires that do not suppose a threat to be monitored, but not suppressed. If we don't take the opportunity of this good use of fire, we will face much more difficult situations with worse consequences in terms of both of losses and greenhouse gases emissions as well. I think it's important to remember this, that, that we need to find the balance of the use of fire uh, under prescribed conditions and with not so worse consequences, 
and, and the reduce of greenhouse uh, gases and the, the fight against climate change. Of course, it's related to human activities. There is a demand in the use of fire in rural lands and we need to work with the population. Uh, this is key. Also, sectorial, sectorial policies need to be integrated. If this is being said, we are in a cross-cutting, cross-sectoral um, situation. So the effort of all actors uh, with a role and responsibility in wildfire risk reduction is a must. Um, so let's try to talk more with other sectors. Let's try to integrate other sectors more in these type of events, in conferences as well. Um, I think we need to start to talk to others more. Uh, whenever I, wherever I go, in whichever conference I am, I hear that we're talking at technical level, a research level, mainly and mostly in same terms. Maybe we use different words, but we agree in the in in the main lines to to take into consideration. But we need to involve other sectors. I think that's one of our main or our main challenges. Sorry. And just to finish, to highlight also the importance of post-fire post actions. They need to be seen as an opportunity to work towards the resistant and resilient landscapes we're looking for. When planning natural or artificial regeneration or of affected areas. And I will leave it here and I will open for, for more intervention later on. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, for your great insights. And uh, besides your previous presentation, uh, and our next speaker is Dr. Tiago Oliveria. Uh, Dr. Oliveria, the floor is yours. Hey, good morning and good evening. Uh, I would like to, 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 to ask to, to the, the presentations, the, the upload of the slides, please. But uh, I will uh, resume my talk uh, in order to explain what we are doing in Portugal after the, the tragedy that we had in 2017. More than 120 persons were killed in the dramatic fires of 2017 and Portugal started a transformation process regarding the, the way as Portugal has managed fires. Uh, in previous fire season, the 2000, uh, 1981, uh, 85, 91, uh, 2003, 2005, Portugal had a reaction uh, uh, after the fires were about to invest heavily in suppression resources. This time, uh, the politicians were supported by um, by a parliament commission that approved unanimously a uh, report regarding the way that the Portuguese and the Portugal need to deal about fires in the aftermath of this fire event. And what I'm going to show you is what we have achieved so far as five years has gone by. Uh, slide, please. I will leave the slides uh, uh, for, for the organization committee for, for you to, to have them later on and you can read with the detail what we have achieved so far. I will ask the, the presenter to, 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 to bring the slides forward, please. Uh, please go to the slide number uh, uh, eight, please. Well, most of the work that we have achieved so far is about integrating the, 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 the public policies. Uh, it is about outreaching other entities, other organizations, other departments at the local, uh, at national level. Please put the four sli slides, please. Slide. Another one. Another one. Another one. Okay, this one, please. And, and uh, when we, we, we were asked to, to help the government and we were a technical organization in the beginning, now we are a more uh, institutional organization trying to promote the change in different organizations. What we did was fixing the airplane while flying. We need to, to do a benchmarking with peers. We, we try to stop the bleeding and fix bottlenecks to engage critical uh, entities for accountable results. We discussed at the same time and established a long-term strategy 
and we are nowadays tracking the results and communicate with the stakeholders of the, with all society. It's a huge, it's a huge transformation to uh, have more than 10,000 uh, firefighters and, and forest uh, actors uh, scattered all over the region and work them towards the, the solutions and, and work them uh, on focus on, on envision the same what is needed to be accomplished. Uh, it's critical in this transformation process that the uh, knowledgeable institutions are effective and are performing as, uh, as, as we envision in order to assure that all the processes are, are, are working and are producing the exact uh, key performance indicators. From the perspective of managerial approach, it's very difficult. It's about man managing and put communication forward. Uh, I will show you some, some of the things that we have achieved so far for you to better understand uh, the, 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 the process that uh, we are uh, putting forward at this moment. Another slide, please. Well, for the first time, uh, when the, 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 we were armored by this, we opened the discussion at the political level, bringing several experts from different parts of the world for to, to speak with our prime minister and with key uh, ministers to better understand what other nations were doing in order to 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 to, to address the fires and the forest management. Another slide, please. Um, well, we made uh, key uh, goals because the, the next fire season was 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 in in the reach of eight months. We started working on November two thousand seventeen, and nine months uh, after we were a fire season eating again. So the politicians were quite aware of the need to have a, a win win uh, outcome. So we highlighted the the the, the critical goals. Uh, mostly to protect people, to reduce number of ignitions, to manage fuel around the critical areas, and to reinforce the, 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 the resources uh, at the initial stage, and then uh, empower the decision making at different levels. Next slide, please. I will. I will. I don't know. I, do, I will not go into details, but this is a long process. Uh, from the moment we have decided to make the change and then to implement the change, there's a huge process going on. And for you to better understand, only uh, in October 2021, also because of the pandemics, we had the new system being published as a decree law. So uh, we have a strategy, we have a program with more than 7,000 uh, million euros uh, in budget, but only in October, last October, we had the, the, the system being uh, implemented uh, in a formal way. We have the first national commission for the rural integration of fire management, and now we have this uh, regional, sub-regional commission being implemented. Uh, next slide, please. Well, all the strategy relies on valuing rural areas, relies later on on uh, promoting active management of those areas, People who are more engaged, the landowners are more aware of the expected income because most of the land in, in Portugal is privately owned. Then they will change the behavior and later on they will do an efficient risk management. Next slide, please. Uh, I think one of the, the critical issues that we have put forward is as we have the political body that assures key priorities are in place and funding uh, is being uh, is being. Um, put forward uh, as, as required in five regions and uh, 23 uh, sub-regionals. We have a deliber deliberative political uh, focus, decision-making capabilities in place at those five levels, national, regional, sub-regional. And then, but they are supported technically by, by strong institutional capabilities. And this is the bottleneck so far. All technicians sessions are shared by the agency that promotes integration and the professionalization of the system. And the, our role is putting the, everybody speaking together at the same language, understanding and outreaching to other uh, key areas. For example, forestry departments need to be better engaged and more tuned with range land management because uh, the, um, the forestry, dense forestry, uh, we uh, believe that is no longer uh, capable to support this level of fire threat. So it needs to be 
more grazed, more, 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 more intensively managed in order to reduce the fuel load. But those two departments usually don't speak in the public administration in Portugal, and we need to put them together. One is the uh, Department of Environment, another one is Department of, of uh, Agriculture, and they need to converge and they need to bring together two different type of land, land use and, and, and to promote a better management in order to reduce the fuel load. I think the, the critical issue is this, all this goes not on directive top-down approach, but a mingle between bottom-up and top-down uh, planning, budgeting and monitoring. And this is the critical issue what we are putting forward right now. Next slide, please. The other slide again. And uh, what we have so far, please move slide. It's to track the results and communicate with the stakeholders. So far, we have reduced the number of fires for half. We have duplicated investment, mostly in prevention. More knowledge is being so, is, is supporting decision-making capabilities on the prevention side, but also on, on, on the suppression side. We have a national fire uh, rural strategy, and we have a cohesive program uh, with more than 97 pr projects being tracked every uh, three months. Some slides uh, in the next slides, please. Show what uh, we, uh, we have now. We have a national campaign for the, for, for, for the, for, for the children. Several companies are promoting and are, uh, and are uh, sharing the, the message on, on preventing uh, Portugal uh, fire starts in, in the early beginnings. Portugal calls for you and for all. It's what the, 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 the slogan uh, claims. Um, we have, next slide, please. We have a program that supports the, the local farmers to do the, the use of the fire with, with more tools, with more capability, and also with, with a, 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 a pre-notice. Uh, people are burning the, 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 the rangelands with, with the technical support, and all the organizations are, are speaking uh, each other at a transversal level. National, regional, and sub-regional, please. We also have a, um, a fuel break program implement. It was okay. Next slide, please. Also, we have a, a, a fuel break program being implemented. We are expanding the use of prescribed burning, and we also are promoting the use of of of, of, of cattle and uh, goats and sheep in the in the wider range. But here is a difficulty because uh, uh, we have a problem related to rural amendment, and there is lack. Of, uh, of, of uh, herders and, and lack of or sh or shepherds in the north part of Portugal. Next slide, please. And for concluding, we also have put science together and between the public uh, camp, private companies and universities, we have built a collaborative lab to bring better science uh, for wildland fire management uh, with uh, pushing forward the, 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 the sound science that are out there in European level, also on national scale. To show, to end, I will show you this, the, the next slide, please. Just to highlight you on the slide, on, on the, the upper left, upper right corner, the expansion of budgeting from the from 2017, where only 20% of 143 million euros were spent in the prevention. We are now spending 318 million euros, but now 46% are spent in prevention. On the right, uh, on the other slides, we have the evolution of the suppression resources. Uh, of course, um, they need to, they were a little bit implemented. The number of vehicles on the lower left uh, corner and on the lower right uh, corner, we have the, the, the increase of aerial resources, mainly for the coordinating efforts. Okay, next slide, please. Now the figures are showing up, some results, critical results. As you can see on the lower left, uh, uh, upper left corner, we see the number of reduction of ignitions being killed by half. On the lower left corner, you see the number of ignitions, but uh, with the, the, the type of casualties being uh, reduced. We are maintaining the, 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 the accidental and the, 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 the natural causes of fires uh, steady, of course, that, that like, take longer, but we have hammer down the, 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 the use of fire because people are more aware and people are, are, are reducing their fire activity in critical days. 
which is contributing a lot to reduce the number of ignitions, allowing uh, more resources per fewer ignitions. And now, uh, on, on the other side, we see the, the reduction of burning area. Of course, this burning area is also very related uh, with the good fire of weather meteorological conditions because we didn't have no extreme fire events, uh, of, of fire seasons uh, in the last two years. But of course, uh, some results are also due of better performance and, and better use of resources and better use of, of, of intelligence. Well, the last slide shows, and the end slide, another two slides, please put forward. Uh, sorry, Dr. Oliveria, uh, your time is almost it's, over, and then will you please briefly summarize? Yes, it's. I, I'm asking to put the slides forward. It's to conclude. It's the end, last slide. So to, to, to conclude, I would also like to, to highlight the need for the, 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 the better cooperation and to engage different communities and different entities. That's why we are putting forward the, the, this idea of promote the International Wildland Fire Conference based on governance principles. Every nation, two slides plus, please. That's what, no, the other one. No, so forget it. Thank you. And that's one. Uh, we are going to held in Porto. Uh, Portugal on the on the May 2023 this International Wildland Fire Conference in order to put people together discussing how does this, the, the the fire management principles and and and, and traditional uh, fire um, management uh, practices can be implemented at a broader scale, uh, governing the risk instead of being governed by the risk that is happening happening in most of the countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tiago Oliveria, uh, for a very interesting presentation. Our last speaker is Dr. Katherine Istup. Um, um, Dr. Istup, are you with us? The floor is yours. Yes, I am. Yes. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. <clears throat> so while the presentation is, is, is being uploaded, yes, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. And next one, and next one. So we're talking about integrated fire management. We're talking about how to live with fire in a way that the risk doesn't control us, but we control the risk. And I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, you know my country from the images below. You know my country got from floods and not from fires. Um, but we do have a, a fire challenge here as well. And in working on that fire challenge, I've observed that and, 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 and looking at the broader scope of everything, I really think that almost everything has been done before, either in a different country or in a different scientific discipline or um, uh, in academia or outside of academia. And we know so much already in the world and, and sharing of knowledge is really essential to, um, to find creative solutions for the challenges we're working with. And we need to learn from mistakes and successes elsewhere. And what we need to do for that is we need to have people, we need to train people to make those connections and to bridge knowledge. Because the way that, that um, experts, that scientists, that, that other people pursuing an education are usually trained is like this. There, people are trained and, and excellence is considered in terms of in-depth focus on a specific topic. And I argue that we do need people to have that specific focus, but we also need people who can, who can make that broader connection, who are interested, who speak the language, who have the basic understanding of the broader field they're working in. And so um, uh, I'm the scientific director of the PyroLife Innovative Training Network. It's funded by the European Commission. It's a project of 4 million euros in which we train 15 early stage researchers, PhD candidates in integrated fire management. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is the summary of, of PyroLife. And actually, I think this is the summary of, of how we should deal with fire and, and get these cross-cutting collaborations um, in place. 
In the center, you see living with fire. We need to move from suppression of fires, pure focus on suppression of fires, to preventing of impacts and actually to adapting to fire. Uh, in the top, uh, it's the inter- and transdisciplinary research that is needed on risk quantification, reduction and communication. And in the bottom are the four axes of diversity that... Uh, slide back, please. Yes, thank you. Are the four axes of diversity that we should consider in, in, that, in doing that inter- and transdisciplinary research. So interdisciplinary research is linking between social sciences and environmental sciences. Transdisciplinary means that uh, we as scientists work closely with people in practice to set the research questions, to design the research, and then also to make sure that the research that science does is relevant for practice. Um, in the bottom cross geography, we need to connect the knowledge about fires in different places of the world. So what we do in Paralife is we link or bring the fire knowledge from the south of Europe to the north. And we also do a cross risk approach because here in the Netherlands, we're really good at water management. And so we're, we're looking at lessons we can learn from water management and we apply those to fires, such as bottom up approaches, stakeholder participation. Um, Cross-sector is, is another aspect in power life that is central because we, can't, we, we can work only in science, but the science is not going to be as good uh, if we don't work and, and, and listen to and, and, and work with the people in practice. If we listen to the challenges, if we listen to, to, to all the knowledge that is out there in practice. So it's about this cross-sector collaboration that is needed to work collaboratively. And uh, Lara already mentioned uh, gender diversity and, and the fourth aspect that the four axes of diversity is, is social diversity. And next slide, please. And many people will be surprised when we talk about social diversity on a topic like fire. But social diversity is really important because we need to hear all voices in science and practice and across disciplines. And fire suppression is, is traditionally quite masculine and heroic. Um, but we need for, 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 in order to build relationships, in order to do this, this cross collaborative learning and, and working, we need also the more feminine approaches. And so that means we need the more diverse people than traditionally involved in fire. Um, uh, for that, we need to have more visibility of the diverse people working on fire. We need to combat biases and we also need a safe working climate in which people feel safe and, and heard uh, in order for everybody to contribute to the dialogue. Next slide, please. Um, like I said, the current training is often monodisciplinary, but we need not just the monodisciplinary experts, but also the inter- and transdisciplinary experts who understand fire, who can deal with uncertainty, who can communicate the risks, and who can integrate. Because we need people to speak the same language, and so that we can have this integration at team level. Next slide, please. So we do this in power life with the PhD candidates, um, but we also do this in power geography, a new master course that I founded in Wageningen. In this course, we bridged environmental science and social science and art very, with a very close link um, and, and, and collaboration with people in practice. And it, because there were so many diverse people, this, the students learned from us, we learned from the students, everybody was learning, learning from each other. Next slide, please. Um, through a very close collaboration um, between my group and, and, and for instance, the, the Catalan Fire Service with Mark Castle now, um, we're working on the PhD research of Mark um, on extreme fire meteorology. Um, my students go there, uh, for instance, Brian, who is doing a traineeship, or, or Fiona, who is, who is studying how to create fire resilient landscapes. So we build upon the knowledge in practice together with people working in practice to strengthen the science and the relevance of the science. Next slide, please. This integrated training, we know from, we know from the science that interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research and training is not necessarily easy because some see what the science shows is that some see that bridging di disciplines is in, in, should, 
They consider it to be introductory level or they consider it to be a distraction. And so the challenge is where, how do you embed this and when do you do this in a study program? Because students, we consider that students need a basis um, of their own expertise so that they can share. They also need to be mature and, and realize that it's not just about this. It's really about um, also making those connections. So some of the challenges we, 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 we encounter and, and discuss is how do you select the right people for this? And, and also what is scientific excellence? Because if we're training people to be broad, then the traditional metrics of success, like papers and grants, um, they're not sufficient to, to, to promote excellence in this, in this much more broadly trained group of people. Uh, next slide, please. So I argue that living with fire requires the acceptance of fire and the integrated approach, like many voices here that we already heard have, have said as well. For that, we need inter and transdisciplinary research based on these four axes of diversity and this new way of training. So together with our future experts, we can build upon the strength in science and practice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katherine Yistif, for your very insightful presentation. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have enough time and we, we need to move on to the next session. But uh, please uh, join me in giving all the warm round of applause for the, all the speakers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, okay now we, our very last session is closing and summary. And for the closing remarks, uh, I'd like to welcome His Excellency Mr. Ricardo Calderon, Executive Director of Asian Forest Corporation Organization. Please welcome him. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bay. First and foremost, uh, Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, panelists, resource persons, ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, I would like to thank our distinguished partner organizations, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and the Korea Forest Service for making this forum very successful. The forum has also brought together representatives of international organizations, researchers and policymakers to, develop, to deliberate anew on the state of forest fire management in the country, in the region and globally. The astonishing insights and expertise of the speakers were shared with us today. Of course, my deepest gratitude goes to all who attended this forum and helped it make such a successful event. In this forum, speakers have shared the alarming frequency and gravity of forest fires. Research shows that changes in climate create warmer and drier conditions, thereby prolonging the drought season thus increasing the risk and frequency of forest fires. Forest fires pose, pose a serious threat to human lives, including nature. We have just passed the fire season in the Republic of Korea and noted the extent of the recent wild, wildfire that occurred in Uljin County and Samsyok City. I am from the Philippines, but I've been living in Seoul for the last 15 months. The proactive response and preparedness of the Korea Aviation under the Korea Forest Service is a clear manifestation that in order to contain and arrest forest fire, institutional capacities, knowledge, and skills, including investment in science and technology, are the very important component of forest fire management. These have become part of the important discourses shared in today's session. We have also confirmed that clear, timely, and relevant data collection is important to cope with forest fires and that forest fire management must go beyond forests to include infrastructure, health, transport, tourism, and other sectors. Thus, the integrated fire management through this new program, assuring the future of forests with integrated risk management or a firm mechanism prepared by the Korea Forest Service and FAO will surely work to advance this element. Also, I would like to announce that APOCO uh, recently launched, this, uh, at the middle of this session, 
our project entitled The Capacity Building on Enhancing Resilience to Forest Fire and Local Livelihood in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam, or the CLMB countries, but capacity development component encompassing all the 16 member countries of the Asian Forest Cooperation Organization. Forest fire can be prevented, forest fires can be managed, forest fires can be suppressed through collaborative, integrative, and multi-sectoral approach, coupled with investment in science, technology, and people. The task of ahead of us is all not easy one. However, the level of commitment displayed in this forum encourages us to confront the challenges of forest fire and their impact on climate change. We have to do more and we have to do it together to ensure the sustainable management of our forests and protect human lives. Thank you very much. Kamsaham nida mabuhay. Thank you, Excellency, for a very meaningful message. Uh, now we have Ms. Veronica Marquez on behalf of Green Climate Fund. Please welcome her. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be, to be here with you. Um, so we heard today that wildfire behavior is changing with climate change and that with the support of science-based information, we can better understand and register the depth and the speed of change led by wildfires, as the resilience of ecosystems to multiple climate change stressors can be further compromised. We also heard that forests and wildfires are causing climate change uh, um, feedback loops, further speeding up climate change. And this is of particular relevance in carbon-rich ecosystems, such as peatlands and tropical forests holding irrecoverable carbon. The Green Climate Fund supports impact-based multi-hazards, early warning systems and early actions. And through the systematic investments in the value chain of climate information systems and early action capacities, we can actually incentivize the use of climate information for investments and financial analytics, supporting long-term planning and preparedness. One of the pathways or the routes for the GCF financing based on countries' priorities concerns climate information supporting systemic resilience frameworks. This includes improving the availability of climate information and early warning systems data to help increase resilience against climate-induced damages. For example, in Timor-Leste and in partnership with UNEP, GCF financing aims to strengthen climate modeling and impact-based forecasting to facilitate fire risk mapping and fire event analysis incorporating local knowledge. Forecast-based financing mechanisms are currently being supported by the GCF as an innovative mechanism that allows predictability based on anticipatory action that can also help to reduce the recovery costs after a wildlife emergency is declared. This includes, for example, the establishment of shock response contingency funds and cash transfers that can be linked to wildfire events. But definitely, we need to continue producing and registering information on the socioeconomic costs of fire damages. Through our readiness funding, the GCF is supporting the establishment of national frameworks for climate services and monitoring systems to strengthen the generation and update of climate services. And through regular funding of projects and programs, the GCF supports the piloting of multi-hazard early warning systems and disaster communication systems using digital technologies. While the public sector and donor funding have traditionally supported the establishment and maintenance of early warning systems, including for wildfire prevention, a vibrant bi private sector is now emerging as countries start enabling the conditions through better policy incentives that can unlock private sector investment in the climate information services value chain. Climate finance, including the GCF, can be critical in structuring financial mechanisms that support the provision of, of information services for the resilience of key impacted sectors, such as infrastructure, tourism, and health. 
We congratulate the Korean government, FAO, and UNEP, GCF partners, for the announcement of the Global Fire Management Platform. We stand ready to continue supporting the countries in their efforts to prevent and manage forest fires through innovative co-financing initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Market. And now we have two more messages for the announcement of the Global Fire Management Platform. Firstly, we'd like to invite Ms. Susan Gardner, Director of Ecosystem Division in UNEP, uh, through the video message. Wildfires are growing in intensity across the world, whether that's Australia, Canada, United States, China, Europe, across Africa and the Amazon, they're wreaking havoc on the environment, on wildlife, on human health, and infrastructure alike. And this, a stark warning that's also echoed in the recent IPCC report on climate impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. In our recent UNEP grid r and report, spreading like wildfires, the rising threat of extraordinary landscape fires echoes the IPCC findings. Climate change and land use change are projected to make wildfires more frequent and intense, with a global increase of extreme fires by up to 14% by 2030, and 30% by the end of 2050, rising as much as 50% by the end of the century. You see, wildfires and climate change are mutually exacerbating. Wildfires are made worse by climate change through increased drought and higher air temperatures. And at the same time, climate change is made worse by wildfires. So it's a repeating cycle. This is mostly occurring in ravaging sensitive and carbon rich ecosystems like peatlands and rainforests. And this turns landscapes essentially into tinderboxes, making it harder to halt rising temperatures. 70% of the world's fire sensitive tropical habitats burn more frequently today than they did in the past. That's 70%. And under such pressure, ecosystems are losing some of their key ecological functions. The report also finds that an, there's an elevated risk for even Arctic and other regions that have been previously unaffected by wildfires. And it's important to remember that like climate change impacts, wildfires disproportionately affect the world's poorest nations for days, weeks, even years after the flames subside. They impede progress towards the sustainable development goals and deepen social inequalities. Friends, we're at a crossroads. It is no longer a matter of if we need to do something, but it's a matter of how fast we need to act on wildfires. While the situation is extreme, we have to understand it is not hopeless. We've seen wonderful case studies from around the world where focus on fire prevention and preparedness has excellent results through, for example, community-based fire management. But to be successful, we do need radical change in public spending on wildfires. Currently governments, they respond to wildfires too much putting money into the wrong places with a reactionary focus to fire management rather than being proactive with planning. Emergency workers and firefighters on the front lines who are clearly risking their lives to fight forest fires need to be supported clearly. And currently direct response to wildfire typically receives over half of the related expenditures while planning receives less than 1%. So governments are encouraged to adopt a new fire ready formula, investing in fire risk reduction. With two thirds of spending devoted to prevention, preparedness and recovery, and just one third left for a response. This while working together with local communities, strengthening global action to fight climate change will help us minimize the impacts of wildfires. And this will also require effective cooperation and a joint approach across all sectors that are affected by wildfires as well. To this end, UNEP and FAO have joined forces to set up a global fire management platform, which aims to strengthen countries' capacities to implement 
integrated fire management and reduce the negative impacts of wildfires on livelihoods, landscapes, and global climate. Based on the one UN approach, the two agencies envision a global platform that will provide countries with the international best practices and help them be better prepared to minimize the risks of extreme wildfires. And in fact, we look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Then the next congratulatory remarks will be delivered by Ms. Maria uh, Helena Semendo, Deputy Director General from FAO. Please welcome her. Thank you and uh, good afternoon to all. I know it has been a long day to all of you, but let me start by thanking you and to all the speakers for this very dynamic and important discussion on fire management. As reflected in the different presentations today and in many recent analyses, we need a transition in tackling wildfires from reaction and response to prevention and preparedness. This will contribute to addressing the approximately 350 million hectares of land burned by wildfires every year and also lower the greenhouse gases emitted for these fires, estimated at 10 to 15 percent for 2019 to 2020 alone. FAO has led the development, as it has been said by uh, the Gr Green Climate Fund and by UNEP, the develop development of in an integrated fire management approach that helps governments understand the causes and factors driving wildfires to seek long-term sustainable solutions. In line with today's key messages and recommendation, the Food and Agriculture Organization advocates for a shift in focus from heavy emergency response to sustainable forest and land management practices that reduce risk, enhance readiness, and facilitate recovery. Integrated fire management implies a holistic approach to addressing fire issues that consider biological, environment, cultural, social, economic, and policies interactions. FAO champions this approach through the use of the five elements we call the five R's, and they are review and analysis, risk reduction, readiness, response, and recovery. We support member countries in integrating all fire-related activities in a coherent ma manner into national policies, planning, and implementation and the balance between them is appropriated and effective. For example, I will repeat an example you have already referred, the Timor-Leste one, and I think we all share the same best practices. The Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries, with technical assistance from FAO, conducted a review and analysis on fire to support government efforts in addressing the important issues of slash and burn and wildfire. The review reinforced the national capacity to understand fire issues in the country, to underpin efforts to reduce fire incidents and address the negative impacts of fire in Timor-Leste. Dear participants, today's extreme wildfires are out of balance with the natural cycle not in sympathy with landscapes and negatively affecting sustainable development. Integrated fire management needs to reach a new level of acceptance and implementation from country level to community application. The community, I think, is very important in all of this discussion. This is why FAO is working with UNEP to co-develop a global fire management platform echoing our existing collaboration in the context of the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration and the one UN approach. 
the Global Fire Management Platform will allow us to scale up integrated fire management, building on existing capacities of countries and engaging with the wonderful examples presented today. I think I refer to Timor Leste, but several other examples and success stories have been shared today. The platform will be developed to meet the demands of national governments and other actors to address the negative impacts of damaging wildfires before they start. The platform will make global technical competence and integrated capacity of all partners available to member countries in a coherent, comprehensive and consistent way over time. It will do this through becoming a global reference point for fire history, fire data, information and knowledge, working with communities, agencies, countries and institutions to strengthen integrated fire management capacity at national levels and providing access to excellence in fire management globally. We look forward to working with all our partners in this exciting initiative. And we can uh, follow today that we are all aligned, we are all ready to collaborate and to cooperate. Thank you again for your cooperation and let's start working. Thank you, Excellency. Um, when Peter and I prepared this forum, uh, I thought it's very long session, but I might be wrong. And I'd like to wrap up the forum and thank all the participants for having attended this forum and for the honors of having been with you. Thank you very much.